There it is. Christopher Genwine in the house. Yeah. For this Artist Porta Peace. extraordinaire. This is Christopher Genwine. It's a privilege to be here with Lou. I think this is the best conversation about art that you could possibly have in the whole, the, within the sound of my voice. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, we have known each other secretly for a really long time. And we have done some stuff together, like very quick. And uh, here's the word, propinquity. I don't know this word. Word of the day, propinquity. It means like how dolphins swim together and they just automatically, we've been like that. Yeah, yeah, for, yeah. for a while. Just on the, same, on the same path, we just see we, each other and be like, sup? We I share a best day. friend. You yeah. gotta, you gotta put it at that level of sure. in law ship. For sure. You know, we Fair. got family, and I, I've known you for a long time. I, I think both of us are qualified polymaths. You know, we've, uh, we've mastered a lot. And I introduce myself as a sport of peace because that's my Instagram, and on it, right underneath that, the sport of peace, it says mastery, excellence, and magic. And that's what this is all about. That's what every conversation you and I about art or music have ever talked about. Uh, I'm a person that has sang in a choir for 30 years and I have a real uh, art education with a great master teacher now. Uh, probably because I had some art information before that. I kind of I kind of was able to invite myself into an atelier with Paul Missel, who is a great master teacher. Uh, here in Portland for the last five <laughs> decades. Uh, and uh, as a great master teacher at PNCA and getting all the, both all the uh, uh, Professor Emeritus awards and, and having his doctorate and, and all of that formal stuff, uh, he also happens to sing in the choir that I've sung in for coming up on 30 years, we're actually still singing together. This is the church choir? Yeah, in some form. And we sang for David York for over 17 years. So, and David York is one of the great choir directors from around here. So our, our musical, uh, 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 the level, the benchmark was pretty, pretty dang high. And uh, uh, so I was able to invite myself into the atelier that Paul teaches at our spiritual center. And uh, uh, I spent five years in there. I got an email from him that said, that complimented my work, I'm not gonna go too far, but uh, it kinda, kinda like, it's okay boy, you can go on your own now and you can do your own work. Um, after I had kinda dabbled in art, I've been a stylist. So uh, I'm one of the best hair colorists in the world. I am, retired. <laughs> but, and I have a thing about the salon industry which we, you know, as art really unfolds to be way more important than anybody thought it was for the last 35 years. Oh, art Let's go didn't, to super cuts. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> art didn't go away during the times of us ignoring. Exactly. Just go to super cuts. Just listen to this music. Just accept this box yeah. we have for you. Uh, I remember you talking about that back in the day, being like, you know, I would love to work in a salon, but they can't handle me. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the principles of being in service, and they're happening right now. Right now, uh, uh, one of my friends, Katrina, uh, uh, she put up a meme to, on, on Facebook the other day, and it's like, if you are standing around saying that you can't afford to pay your people these wages, then you should go out of business. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. we don't need you. And there are some businesses in a lot of different sectors that for some reason they pay their self their people really well costco is one of those places oh i work at costco and i'm gonna be fine you know it's for like sure. and and then other people that are working three times as hard that are making three times less you know so i think that's getting fixed right now and it brings us around to the art it brings us around to the art of being human we're gonna mass it there's so much time i'm old i've gotten gravity is affecting me i'm i'm uh I'm going to be 63 in December and uh, still mastering new things, not because of, of like a competitiveness, but of an achievement. And I, I've just followed, there have been certain things that have been so inspiring that I have followed them 
like we follow music when it's composed properly and it shifts and changes and we wind all over the place. And yeah, you just got to follow what's <clears throat> following you directly. Um, so uh, uh, I, mastering things is one of the things that we've gotten confused with education and calling the part of our education that adapts us to this society, calling that our education when really it's mastery. And that is the great liberating thing, is the learning of things. Um, I think, it, you know, we can learn so many things without the adjoining enlightenment that goes with it. I think a lot of people understand how to lay bricks and they become a brick worker. And it's about 10 years later that they realize they can design. <laughs> you know, they can make a lot more than just a bricklayer that they were 10 years before. That mastery that they've embodied has now become, they, they can apply their own personal excellence to it. And that excellence is like what brings about, the only way you can have magic in any form of real magic, synergy, one plus one equals two or more, the, that always comes from our excellence. So that's on my Instagram in a couple of different places. There's nothing magic about excellence. And everything excellent about us is magic. I feel what you're saying. Because it's practice. Yeah. And, and it, so Two Set Violins is one of my favorite YouTube channels. It's two violin players talking about what it's like to be in an orchestra and be a classical musician and play the violin. And <clears throat> as they went on, my God, they got 2 million followers. And there are these two Australian Chinese uh, of, of Chinese descent, but they live in Australia or New Zealand. And uh, they're a crack up. They are, they, and uh, so they're uh, practice. They, they, have a, they have a high collared shirt that has embroidered on it, practice. And they have a shirt that says, Practice 40 hours a day. And when they sign up from their videos, okay, we got to go. I got to go practice. Um, yeah. That is exactly what master is. I think that we, the conversation about mastery is about how it feels to be in those different places. You know what it feels like to be a drummer and pick up sticks for the first time. You're going to suck. You know? Uh, I mean, people don't want to spend enough time there. Um, <laughs> You know what I mean? It's like, that's a fine place to be. Like, you're not going to be Neil Peart, like, probably ever. But you know what I'm saying? Like, that's that's not... Like, a lot of people, they're inspired by, say, Neil Peart, and then they want to do that. But it's like, you have to enjoy this. Like... You know what I mean? And if you can't, like, meditate and enjoy on that, you're not going to get there. <laughs> and, you know, you spend years, like... I love that we're talking about drummers. I always feel that for a drummer in a song that I know the singing is going to be really fun, but the beat is like that. And I'm like, you got to be bored to death right now. To practice all those things. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, I feel it. I think over, I think over time with a drummer, um, not to tangent away from what you're saying, but I think over time with a drummer, you just get like a bag, a bag of tricks, you know, and then you're just playing Dude. the beat. Everyone, you don't have to worry about chords, right? Yeah. So you just filling that shit yeah. in. You know. All right, so the exceptional drummer that I hang out with, Elliot Sit. I'm looking at the camera because I know yeah. Elliot Sit. Elliot Sit, you know, to me, growing up around, you know, in the in the uh, spiritual center in that environment, there's always great musicians, great sound people, you know, people that do not mess around at yeah. all. Yeah. Um, uh, so really high end musicians, somebody that I, I, we really talk about music, you know. Um, uh, we're listening to Jacob Collier, but you know, we got it. We got it. Ooh, uh, uh, that, and, and I, um, uh, I start, started thinking about Jacob Collier, and I lost it. Just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> he's too mind blowing. Yeah, I know, really. So, um, the what, the the part of of the beginning, or we're talking about drummers. Uh, the the working with really good musicians, um, there's not one great drummer that I know that's not in six bands. And hanging around with Elliot, listening to him do the stuff that we did that was always relatively square, 
and then he works with a um a, a hard rock sound guy that um is it's almost like classical music they really got to count it and there's changes that really change for and watching Elliot be those different types of drummers just like you said he transcends the box kind of guy and I know lots of drummers like that you're gonna get what they get and it was a drummer once that made me aware of being a singer is just as special a thing because I could never get on a kit and well, make sounds no no way way too way too right-brained or whatever but um we were down in the basement and we were having a jam and this guy was kind of on a half kit next to me and we were messing around with some Steely Dan and this guy asked me if I knew a song and it, it was that one that starts Agents of the Law. Agents of the Law! You know, and I sang that into a mic and he went, bam, bam. And this guy kind of did the drums but then I started singing it and real big and real out and like that. And I saw him looking up at me like, I wish I could sing. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. I never really hang out with musicians like that or be in that position like I ended up being in, you know. But uh, uh, the transcendence of mastery, the excellence that somebody brings beyond, you know, musicians that go all the way to understand jazz, uh, hairstylists that become educators that really get into the art of doing hair where the real education... Uh, uh, is not vocationalized, taught to you in pieces, you know, and that's what was happening in art. And it's one of the great indicators that's going on right now. That's very important information. I'll look at the camera. What's happening in the art world, the deconstruction of those vocationalized schools that give you an art degree and you really don't have skills because you haven't practiced. You don't have the mastery from having an unvocationalized education that's you know there's stuff that paul missile teaches us in that atelier that's 800 years old 1200 years old and those great masters through the ages are called that because they leave something behind that changes the way we do art well because you can't get to the magic part if you haven't like gotten to into the mastery zone and then almost become bored you know what I mean? Like you have to spend enough time there. You know what I mean? You can't get to the magic. It's that know? thing. There, you know, mastery has so many stages, and uh, um, those things in our life. Tennis was the first thing that tennis player. I mastered, and yet there was something that I mastered before that, and it was obedience training and field training dogs. And the, the interaction between dog and man has grown since, you know, I was born in the 50s. And so through the 60s and the 70s, the way we trained dogs then was before dog whisper, you know, and then, but that I was like 14 years old. And that was the first thing that I learned like this, you know, uh, uh, I, I know everything there is to know about a shotgun <laughs> and, and uh, uh, shoot and trap and skeet with my dad. And uh, we had English Springer Spaniels. And there was a time that I was sitting in a position and there was a bird behind me. And not a Springer Spaniel, but a German Shorthair was running at me. And on the, all the different levels of what we are, even as an adolescent boy, I was still an artist and I was still observant, you know. And catching the form and looking the dust fly and, and everything that happened with that dog. But as it got nearer to me, I was kind of amazed at something I'd never seen before. The eyes of that predator didn't move at all. Every flipping thing about that whole body that's going 90 miles an hour, you know, mm -hmm. behind that pair of eyes... It, they don't move. And the eyes were fixed as they went by me. And I realized the very next thing I learned to do was tennis, which is a martial art. The sport is obviously so white ass and so not what we want in the future, I mean, you know. And yet the martial art that it is teaches us how to be an artist with our body. And... And like the martial arts, teach us how to be an artist with our body. Yeah. And, and, and that spreads us out for the rest of our lives. You can't look at doing hair. The big thing about people that do hair, you're not an artist, you're a technician. Just fake it till you make it. Instead of teaching people the real principles of what they're actually doing, yeah. you know. 
to the same guy with music. Yeah. Once you learn to play tennis, once you see that dog's eyes, you're built to be that paralyzed that doesn't move. You're built to never lose that ball. That's it, you'd never know it about tennis players, but they never lose. There's no other human on the other side of the court. It's the ball. There's, there's nothing but that ball and your eyes never leave it and your body totally corresponds and there's no communication. You know what I mean? When your body just knows what to do too, it's so crazy. And, and that, you know, this is the mastery of a musician. Once a musician has music, this is, you know, um, the thing that, it, the, the most important thing, it's the thing that takes us forward. You know, and that's what I want to talk about in the future. We have to do more than nine shows, I'm sure. And this is just <laughs> yeah, the first man. one. For sure. Mm. I know. I should, I, I'm surprised we didn't do one already. But what this is, is how we change. And we got that as a hunger inside of us right now. We want to see us, as humans, not be so stupid. You know, I mean, on every level, if we could just not be so dumb. And it's like... Forget that shit. You're still going to be dumb. You're still going to be stupid. You're still going to know what you're doing is wrong. And you're going to do it anyway. You know, and it's like, that's you. That's me. That's everybody around us. It's our society. We got to accept that. But what's with us is that magic. What, what's with us is the call to be excellent. And, and, and if we get away from trying to educate everybody to be a forma, and instead, you know, the education for... Uh, you know, the, the, there are other cultures right around us that honor the, the mastery of different arts in life, you know, to, to understand dogs or be a tennis player. Or, um, my mom can cook, so I can cook too. And I was just a person who could um, kind of hold pitch. And then I sang for five years and I thought I was good. And then I sang for 10 years and I'm like, I'm good. And then I sang for 20 years and I'm like, yeah. And people go, oh, what do you sing? And you're like, everything. <laughs> you know, um, there's, there's an excellence that comes that never leaves the group. And singing in the choir is what teaches us to do everything. And I think recently, just because I never really did it, but recently I understood the difference between blending and putting the solo stuff into solos and it makes it fun now i'm singing in a new dimension even after you know so long but that's what is important going forward to change everything that we understand what's against us is our you know and and it comes from the 1960s i think we we met the enemy and it's us you know, if anything, the pandemic, we met the enemy and it's us. What do you mean the 60s? It's from Pogo. I think it's from the 40s. Um, I don't know. It's from a cartoon in the newspaper called Pogo. Okay. And I think it was sometime around or between the wars or something that it became a famous thing. We've met the enemy and it's us. <laughs> yeah. And our yeah. tools to fight with are our mastery and our excellence. And, and that's what brings about the magic. You know, and I, as an artist, I can imagine, you know, uh, uh, Wilson River Pottery. Yeah. Uh, out in uh, out. Tillamook on the coach, uh, on the coast, rather. Uh, uh, one, one of my best friends and my family live out there. And Wilson River Pottery makes really, really simple pottery that they don't overprice. And the way they decorate it is just like everybody else, except for excellent. You know, just, and it's, it, that cup is, you know, I go to my friend's house and it's like, hey, I need a Wilson River pottery cup. <laughs> you know, you guys like, and, and on that level of somebody, that ceramicist can, can have that fulfilled life, just like that drummer that plays square shit all the time, you know, or a singer that just sings in a choir or a painter that paints like me. I, I'll paint anything. I don't, I love art. The experience. Yeah. And it's like to experience that communication. Um, you know, I think, uh, uh, as we just think on those things as achievable rather than w when we, we've kind of been taught when we think about education, 
you know, it's going to be going to take my time. It's going to you know, pisses me off so much. No, don't educate yourself at all then. Don't, do, you know, and I got to say this. Education, like the real meaning of the word for me, comes from um, one of my clients has kids that are in the Waldorf school system. And the guy that started the Waldorf, and of course I, I, I will know his name someday. Um, but he said the the education the meaning of education is giving people a reason to understand the need for change Say that again. to need... education the reason for education is to help people to understand the need for change okay and, and it's like i never think of education as like change but when i think of the stages of mastery you know like like you said where you start out you're you're not going to be Neil Peart. You're always going to be heading that direction, you know. Um, but uh, uh, being where you are is better than you were ten minutes ago, and you're not the drummer that you were six months ago. And you get what I'm saying. And it's amazing to do something for four decades. And it feels like, because I, I'm just taking to drumming again, I took drum lessons for a little while just because it was the one thing that I didn't do, you know? And I was like, I, I like going into things when I'm in over my head, so to speak, you know? It's like, all right, let's start fresh, you know? And um, for me, it's like uh, to go in and have to really start at like elementary beginning level, you know? It's, it was a wondrous thing. And and my teacher was, like, all impressed because I actually practiced, you know? Like, cause, you know what I mean? People just, like, you know, he sees a lot of kids that won't practice or whatever. And it's, like, but I was just, like, actually came back a little bit better each week, you know? But that just changed my whole life, understanding rhythm, Change. you know? Change. But go, going back into it as an adult and not being, like, you know when you see a snare drummer, like, you're just, like, oh, I, you know, like you said earlier, I could never do that. Yeah, right, 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 right. But when you do go back to just, like, like ABC blocks, you know, it's like, all right, you get A, B, and C, you know what I mean? We're not giving you the other ones yet, you know? You're just like, just, you know, and that's that's like with, with, with teaching music too. It's like, um, I was just ranting the other day actually on Instagram about music teachers and I was talking about how they um, don't teach us how to play, you know? Um, what they should have done is given you, all right, you get one, two, and three. Now take that home. Fuck with that for a while and come back when you're ready for four. You know, once you got one, two, three, two, three, two, one, one, three, one, two, one. You know, once you got, once you're bored with those, we'll add another one. And then one, two, three, four. Now you really know four because it's the one that's different. And then it's easy to just add them on and all of a sudden you know them all. And then you're like, one, two, three, four. Flat two one, you know what I'm saying? It's like there's color tones in there that you can get to if you you know, but you can't do that otherwise. And people, um, I feel like it's fine with me, kind of in a way, because it's like you don't deserve to be, you don't deserve the power if you aren't gonna, <laughs> you know, win Gaudium Leviosa. Like you gotta learn yeah. your shit, you know. Uh, uh, I think, but I'm the... just mad because no teacher ever told me it was easy. Oh. You know, and right, right, in what you were saying, that the most ancient bone flutes that we can fi- have have five holes in them, you know. Probably the pentatonic. And that's on, that's on Howard uh, Goodall's The Story of Music. That's on YouTube for free. And it's six yeah, episodes. It's They're about serious. an hour long. Right at the beginning, he's talking about the most ancient, ancient, ancient things, you know. And what you just said relates to the greatest teacher, and I've been talking about Paul a lot, so that's why we have to have nine episodes, because we got to have one with Paul, and I will get him. That would be great. I've known him for a long time. I got ins with him. We'll, <laughs> we, will, we will have an epic episode. Cool. Um, but um, uh, the great teacher is not somebody that gives you a program or a curriculum. The, I was in an atelier with a great master art teacher. And he would go around, he, all right, you guys draw that. You know, no matter what it was we were working on through the progression of our working together. And after we did all the, the work on composition, and that's, you know, that corollary between art and 
or visual arts and, and music sound arts, you know, is a lot the same. But the teacher would, it, in an atelier, where it's not about education, it's about mastery. Like the experience. And it's, it's just exactly like Jedi training. It's a Jedi. He's not just gonna leave you somewhere. And there's some places that he builds you up to a point. But after we got done looking at each other's work and learning to critique composition, then we had to draw. Uh, he would go do a demonstration, and then we would draw. And this is how it still goes on. <clears throat> while you're drawing, as you get going, he waits a little while, and then he literally comes over and sits where you're... All right, move. <laughs> Hand me your pencil and your eraser. And he takes over your drawing. That's great. And what that is, is just exactly, we have one fly. Um, what that is, is standing with the student and taking them one step further. Just like what you said, that adding that one note. Well, adding, only he can watch you and know what that is. <laughs> and that's the thing, is, is not only the experience of having a great master teacher, but doing that teaching in a way that can't fail. You can't produce an artist that only partially understands what's up. You know, those of us in, in the, the, the group, and I think it was either 10 or 11 of us, he would, as we were finishing up drawing, he would get us to the place he'd be like, that's over-highlighted in that area, and those, those highlights are much too light, and you could work in some more shadow in that area. And we would be like, okay, so... Why is the highlight wrong? He's that's just not where the highlights go. And he let us go like 10 weeks for that. And at the end of it, so all of us at one moment were like, tell us where the highlights go. <laughs> and he's like, okay, now I'll tell you where the highlights go. And so, and it gave us that new note, you know, and he knows a lot about jazz. <laughs> he knows the whole jazz of all how to teach art. And, and that atelier is him teaching at, this end of his career exactly the way he wants to teach and and you know i think i was that student just like you going and starting oh whoa a a, a real musician is going to come and take drum lessons from me or whatever i'd be a little bit apprehensive or whatever you know and i think paul was like oh dang because when i was young at the beginning i was doing watercolors and I went to Hawaii and I did these watercolors, right? And I showed them to Paul and he was like, you should get into some other media. And I just went, oh, I could only watercolor, you know? And he was like, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you stay with your three notes, dude. <laughs> you know? and it was like, it was great. And then when I'm like, can I join the hotel? He's like, come on, baby, <laughs> you know? And, and I became that, you know, I became that person that, I received that email and he said, he said, in any class I'd be teaching right now, you'd be getting an A plus. And that is it. We can look at some of my work right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think any artist, probably the worst thing is to have us uh, uh, look at our art. Because um, uh, if I want to talk about art, I, I don't want to talk about my art. <laughs> And the closest... I never thought about that. No one's ever made me, like, listen to one of my own songs. <laughs> and, I, you know, the critique, it's really weird because it's writing partners, and you got to say that in music, it's writing partners. There's, there's a lot, more than it would seem, you know, there's writing partners, and I think what it is, is that critique that's going on. Yeah. You yeah, know, like that's a dumbass note right there. That's me and Brett, yeah. Or when you hear Donald Fagan talk about the mechanics of how they put together Steely Dan music, you know? And he's just saying, we did it, and then we put, laid that over there, and we got this vibe going on, and we're like, stop it! It's magic! It's not just music! You can't just say, yeah. it came out of you as a fountain of, like, no, no, it's not. It's not a golden fountain of magic first. You know, it's like we did this, we did that, and it was good, yeah. you know. And, and he's saying we, you know, and, and um, you know, that's really important. Um, you know, I'm doing this work, but I still don't, if I have an opportunity to have my teacher look at any piece of work, 
that I've done. It's that critique that I'm after. And I think from being in a band with other musicians, that's how come I had to sing with Blue Swan as an adventure rock band, um, which we did six performances as a, a you know, a band of real uh, talented people that kind of, you know, <laughs> as we should have. But the reason my Lily White butt got invited is because I'd be laying right there in that room and they would start playing a song down there and it'd be like, I, that's yeah. good. Like I got the, vo the vocals. Uh, well, what it was, was um, uh, Amanda Friedland. Amanda Lynn Friedland. And we got more than one Amanda, so I'm forgiven there. Amanda Lynn Friedland was down there singing basically by herself. And she is a gorgeous, gorgeous soprano. And I knew that Elliot and Patrick were down there. And I'm like, boys, let's get with it here. I can see that there are some backups missing. And I'm like, and so I would stand there and sing just a little bit. And that led to, I did that 10 times. And, but that's exactly me. You know me. I'm, not, I'm like, wait a minute. Come on, you guys. And, uh, and. And the, the thing about singing with David York uh, on, you know, uh, being one of those people standing there on a Sunday morning watching him solve musical challenges. I, it really, I know that it's super cool. Um, but Sunday morning, everybody has done their individual rehearsal, but now we're bringing it all together in a rehearsal before the, uh, before the services start. And, um, when something doesn't quite go, it was for David to unstick it, smooth it, and make it work. And I watched him do that more than a thousand times. And I wasn't just watching, I was observing and learning and watching his mastery. And I would go down there and tell him what to do. And I know I would sound like David York, but that was fine because I knew so much more about music than I thought I knew, you know? Anyway, so... Then they had a beautiful tenor uh, basis, but he was going in a different direction. So then they asked me to join. And we did a couple of things vocally that were well worth doing it, you know. And I got to sing a rock song, a pop rock song in it. And it makes me officially a rock star. Because <laughs> I played in a rock band and I had one solo. Yeah. Hell yeah. And there you go. That's, I can add that to my polymath things that I do. Um, <clears throat> um, what to do with our mastery and what to do with the excellence that we want to bring in is never an angsty yank towards magic. And when, as we look at my art here, I'm going to start out with a magic piece that came from just, you know, bringing it out organically. As I began to play flat ball baskets, disc golf. I don't like the word disc golf. It's a fast frisbee, a beveled throwing disc. Okay. But we throw it into a basket. And for some reason we came up with the word golf, which like it's not golf. <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't serve. We score it like golf. So flat ball baskets is I've done that for about 10 years now and somebody showed me a beveled edge, a, a Frisbee with a flattened edge and we'll get there. Um, and just seeing it, I knew that me and that sport were friends. I'm like, I'm throwing this. I want to make this. And what it is, is aircrafting. You, there's a relationship between the disc and the air and the speed and the turn and the fate, you are air crafting. You are crafting the air towards those chains that hang above a basket. It's paradise. It's paradise. It makes a sound. It goes ka -ching in a way that you do not know. Yeah. So that mastery, that excellence that's coming up with me, I just spent a whole bunch of money to get a practice basket so I can finish putting so I can be effective in tournaments. After 10 years of organically learning that, that martial art like tennis it's the second tennis for me and i can do it because i used to play tennis i can be physical in that way and get up to my athletic and i'm just now stretching out and get back in the gym after the rona 
Hey. <laughs> but uh, playing disc golf, there were there were places the sanity was saved by disc golf. Um, the chains were up down in Wilsonville through the whole thing and getting down there and being able to play. Um, you know, it's, it saved the sanity, it kept me walking and everything like that. And, uh, and painting also. Um, so I want to look at my art and other people's art as being an artist you, you know, headlong into that mastery until you know it's a mastery and that can happen really organically over time just like you know i learned tennis in a couple of years but disc golf i took so long to to do it and i was happy making art in a in a less than educated way but then once i got a real art education in like i've been talking about that wasn't vocationalized where a real teacher took me that one step forward until i could fly until I was a powerful Jedi myself. You, and what to do with that is to serve. To find a way that it serves. It's what you do. And it's, it, it is very, very contrary to a lot of messages that we, but um, there's a great saying about um, that's very simply, or it's a Wayne Dyer. And Wayne Dyer went through many different formations of a, of a speaker and a sharer of wisdom and knowledge in his life and got very spiritual towards the end of his life. And he said, when you say to the universe, I want this, the universe says, then do that. I want this, then do that. I want this, then do that. When you say to the universe, how can I serve? The universe says, how can I serve? And there's a circulation that resonates and gets magnified yeah. in a different way. We have one fly, just <laughs> to get good. real with our metaphysic here. <laughs> um, how can I serve? Is, you know, I'm going to get everything that I want by getting others what they want. Is how art, visual artists work with a commission. This painting that I'm working on right here. This is a piece that I'm actually working on. And I'm just going to hold this up and hope that everybody sees it really good. The foreground needs some work. It's got a couple hours left on it. I'm painting small paintings for people that I have done their hair for more than a couple decades or 15 years or so. You know, people that I've been in community association with and they don't have a piece of mine. If they don't have anything, if they don't have a painting by now, I suck. So, what's left of us after the Rona? This is a photograph that uh, one of my clients, AJ, <laughs> uh, she took. There's a reference photograph that looks like that. Those clouds are epic. Ah, thank you, sir. And uh, they really have some depth to them. They go back. Um. Distal cues, it's one of those things I was talking earlier, you know, like you can put music on a Xerox sheet and just hand it to you and that's music right there, you know, that's, that's everything. There's a list of, of a, a written list of distal cues and you get it when you're, you know, right in the beginning. These are how you make things look like they're going away from you and it's got your entire <laughs> you know, it's got every, you know, being able to do that and, uh, um, you know, it, the adventure of, of, of melodies in music is the adventure of a painter, you know, I get painted out and, you know, a painting like that realism uh, right there is, is a lot more tedious and, and it's like playing classical music, kind of, you know, it's more traditional, it's more functional, it's, you know. It's going to be like that. I'm going to go off camera for just a second and grab another piece. Um, but really quick, uh, uh, it's not like there's a place where artists will stop making sketches of the piece that we're going to work on to get an idea of yeah. the composition. There's never a time we stop drawing. And it, there's never a time that drawing becomes something less. Drawing is that going back to the beginning. One of my friends asked me, how to draw groups of people. And 
underneath those lines and marks that you can see. I'm going to move towards the camera a little yeah. bit. Hopefully it works. Um, you can see that I just rubbed with my fingers and my thumbs. And you might see fingers and thumbs marks and even knuckles that I use. And I'll let you look at it again. You can kind of see where I've rubbed. Yeah. And using the metrics of your fingers gives you this kind of equalizing size of the different and then you just find the heads because <laughs> your fingers will let it go i can't believe i'm gonna we're gonna have to shut everything down get rid of this fly and i'm gonna give you a fly tool here pretty soon all right now i want to grab a piece that is one of the best paintings i've ever done and comes before from before my formal education I at all i remember this yeah and this piece is in glass, so it's kind of hard to see. Here. And I'm gonna lean it forward. Yeah, why don't you bring it up to the screen? With you can, you can help me here. Oh, yeah, bring, bring it down a little bit. Yeah, that looks great. That looks great. Actually, you know what? Can you just tilt it toward the window a little bit? Yeah, now bring it back. Yeah. Like that? Yeah, just trying to get the glare of the Yeah, the, it's got glass on it, but, um, it's all different now move that won't have the same light. There you go. Um, uh, you can see different values in it, different greens and different lights and darks. And then the red color is complementary to it. So it's really simple composition, uh, but lots of different values and something that is just called mark making uh, that I using the brush go in the same direction or just those different variations in the direction plus our friend, the fly. Uh, so this is called Green Waterfall, and it is a wonderful composition, and it kind of starts, and we'll get out of, I'm gonna take it off now. Somebody can pause the video if they wanna look at it for a longer period of time. I, I learned that from the Good Art Channel on YouTube. I do have a recommendation for people who wanna learn art as an artist and start drawing with an artist online if that's what you want to do uh proko tv p-r-o-k-o and it's stan prokopenko who runs the joint stan. and stan, stan yeah prokopenko and he started out uh, and i have just very interestingly enough, one of the latest things, uh, this is what, um, this is a drawing that I was working on and I hate. <laughs> and it looks really cool and, it, and it's like, this is where I am as far as likeness and getting things to look like people. But uh, Stan Prokopenko is very famous for his video, Draw the Head from Any Angle. And he has a 15-minute video that is some excellent, excellent teaching that everybody has to recognize. And uh, there is me doing that, just sitting there in my room to draw. When the, I, I have to get organized to paint. To finish a piece takes hours, but we need to draw. You know, it's like playing an instrument when you're not really writing. Just get it out, get your yeah. fingers on it or whatever. We love you. We love you. You need us. Okay. I got one of those uh, electric rackets. It's oh, really? Up. It's kind of messed up. But. Wait, we will we will have that in future episodes. <laughs> um, I want to say that Stan Prokopenko has a beautiful, beautiful podcast. It's kind of like this. He gets together with uh, a teacher that the generational difference is about like this. And this person has been an art teacher all his life and worked in art and worked in graphic art and, you know, and, a, and a, a, nothing's vocationalized about what they talk about or how he teaches. Stan tarred, started out with teaching different parts of the body because he got famous from, excuse me, draw the head for any, from any angle. Um, now, recently, he has started a basic drawing class that is, just like my education, not vocationalized. And you can pay for part of it, but you can also get it. He's doing it for free because he is a person who has principles that are about resonating and circulating and magnifying what you're doing. Um, so anyway, Proko TV, Stan Prokopenko, 
The Draftsman is the uh, podcast. And that's art mastery. That, that teaches you how to get the mastery the same as everybody else has to go through it. And then to where you get to your excellence. And now talking about visual art is really important. And I know Paul agrees with this, but it's kind of like my thing. Uh, we only, we know great music as soon as we hear that melody. And I, I want to talk about music on another, you know, like really be music focused. Because in this part of my life, understanding music the way I do, and then going back in music, I see the cracks in the fissures where after that, nothing was the same. You could do that then. That person did it and it was a hit. And now you can do that, you know. So those are those change moments. The moments where we had that education where, oh, we changed, you know. Um, uh, in the image arts, and I think it goes the same in music, there has to be, um, in the visual arts, image, story, and poetry. And that's what is... Mm, those elements have to be there for it to be art. And I think a lot of people confuse that image, story, and poetry with something nice. Um, you know, like art should be pretty or art should be engaging for some higher, you know, purpose or whatever. <laughs> Image, story, and poetry is that, that widest idea of that is why abstraction and um, understanding non-representationalism or uh, abstract jazz you know, that actually exists and scares me. <laughs> yeah, free jazz is crazy, man. Yeah. And it, it, it absolutely think, has to exist, just like all those different I forms of art. It's really fascinating how there's a separation, <laughs> and I totally understand. It just took me a second to think about it, but it's like separating poetry from story, you know? It's not just image and story, but it's there's that thing, you know, which could be defined as poetry. Um, There's a... There's a podcast of Malcolm Gladwell's, and I believe it's called The Saddest Story in the World or something like that. It's on his revisionist history. And he talks about the difference between rock music and country music. And in country music, you're allowed to get sad. And they get to the saddest song that's, of course, you know, about divorce or, yeah. you know. and Lost everything. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and all of a sudden it's okay to be sad, you know. Yeah. And I think that probably comes from the blues as a, probably a side note, you know. But yeah, rock and roll, nah. No. It's like, it's like, uh, kind of like, don't be a pussy. Like, <laughs> Dude, uh, uh, I believe and I, and I have no reason to disagree with Malcolm Gladwell ever under any, because re- I know Malcolm Gladwell is going to watch this podcast now that I mentioned this thing. But, uh, <clears throat> They, in his podcast, they use Wild Horses from, from the Rolling Stones as the saddest rock and roll song. That's the line. You cannot cross that line. Okay. Wild Horses being about a young, a, a, a person who used drugs and died. But, you know. Yeah, that's the tragedy. Yeah. And I'm getting depressed, right? I'm getting sad, right? <laughs> uh, it, image, story, and poetry... The, the greatest poet, I think, is Joni Mitchell. And I think the greatest storyteller is Stevie Wonder. Okay. You know, uh, uh, and I think the greatest magician is Quincy Jones. Okay. You know, I mean, just to like, my favorite piece of music in the whole wide universe. Quincy Jones is. Is. He, had, he just as a producer just having that. He knew like the muse, you know. Yeah. And he was like, his, his quote about, you got to stay up late because that's when the muses come. And if he's like, if I don't stay up, she's going to go down the street to so-and-so. <laughs> <laughs> you got to finish. You got to finish. You got to put all the love in it. Uh, uh, beautiful uh, Dr. Cornell West uh, said this, and he, um, right around that recording time, 
secretly behind the scenes, I know great producers shared, um, you know, ideas and everything. And uh, Ashford and Simpson produced an album called Send It. And on there, the title track is a beautiful, it's a, it's a beautiful song. We'll, we'll, we'll have a music episode, okay? This is not just this episode. Um, but Dr. Cornell West quotes that song a little bit loosely, you know, but what he's trying to say, his point is bring back the sweetness that was in music at that time, the sweet sentiment of, you know, uh, and, and it just like a puff of smoke, you got to spread a little hope, you know, send it love, uh, all love has its own wings. You know, it's like songs that were really about love and how we could get it together. Uh, but my favorite piece of music, Quincy Jones producing a um, Herbie Hancock uh, keyboard piece, Tell Me a Bedtime Story, or just Bedtime Story or something. And it's on sounds and stuff like that with all kinds of stars and Shaka Khan and, and uh, um, Patty Austin, who I think was the greatest human singer. Until now, and I got to share with you, uh, Sophia Eurista, I think is the greatest human singer right now. Because guys can't sing. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea why a guy would sing. I, 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 if I were to do music right now, I would reproduce, and, and this, is our, this can be our secret project, some Phoebe Snow jazz stuff that kind of got her all the artists in the industry in 1973 or whatever and and uh what the the tunes that she wrote and the jazz that was in those tunes that kept them from being super poppy needs to be redone yeah she wrote that. some of the best that songs is, but... that oh phoebe snow uh was famous for like one or two hits that went poetry man was one of them just you know it's because we're talking about poetry um, but I'll share that music with you, um, and it's some of the best produced music still to this day, and you'll be with me, you know, it's that analog, that, ooh, ooh. Yeah. and, um, and, but Quincy Jones in, during that time, and it's still the best, the best time, I think that today, uh, I think Prince knew how to sound, not what to play, but how to sound because of Quincy Jones, you know, and then Prince kind of gave us the, the, the abstract for getting away from a driving beat that how that whatever whatever minuses he he broke that he transcended all of that yeah. and i think that makes its way for a whole bunch of modern stuff and then we get to lizzo who knows what to do and you bring it back and it's like her producer is standing on those ideas of quality about layering that is is you know i mean that's it and it it's what resonates and what got magnified back then that comes back around. So what is... I don't know anything about Lizzo. I mean, I know who she is, but I haven't listened to the music or anything. So what is it What is She's it? She's a flute player. Yeah, yeah. And I've seen her she, on like Saturday Night Live or something. Yeah, maybe. she got... Oh, she's very poppy. And she, she does a lot of things with her butt. <laughs> and, and that is... I think that that is part of her statement and I think that that's one of the things that she it, I think that her butt is equally as important as her flute but she's a full uh, musician she studied music you know band girl but she's from Minneapolis and she's cool and I think probably because she was just really cool and the, the exact person that was in the right place at the right time she got to go hang out with Prince and just sit there with a junior producer and her and her girlfriends just riff and shit. And he would go and he would play it for Prince. And every once in a while, Prince would be like, I like that. <laughs> she got to be around Prince when she was a little tiny baby girl. She, you know, growing up, she got to be around Prince. And so uh, she came here and performed in a couple of my insider friends. People that really know what's going on. They're like, Lizzo! And I'm like, what? And they uh, um, they played me some of her earlier stuff. Uh, and I didn't hear her play the flute in that. And in the second one, I was like, um, <clears throat> I cannot sing right now. But she's like, I don't need nobody else. 
Excuse me while I feel myself. And I went, Prince, come on. That, you know, I didn't know she was from Minneapolis. I didn't know that she had it. I just went. Yeah. And, I, it, you know, and I define that so not copying, standing on his yeah. shoulders. Yeah. And she's a big thing to be standing on his tiny shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I feel you, yeah. But yeah. her Tiny Desk concert, you gotta see that. Okay. And she has her flute there, and she picks up that flute. She's got an incredible pfft, for melody, and she can rap, and she's got, oh, melody, and she's got a producer that's putting not too much sound around her and making sure that it works. And I think that she's really good because she's got that one note, you know, that one note instrument. Yeah, yeah, monotonal instrument. Yeah. No, yeah, that's, uh, I mean, it's definitely a huge thing. It's definitely, I mean, um, I have always, uh, I, I love I love what you said about men not singing. Because <laughs> I totally hear you. I've always been the singer in bands, and but when I sing, it's like, it's like a certain thing, you know? But um, I have heard... Uh, you know who Arietta Ward is? She's a local singer. Um, she slays. She slays. Um, you should. You should definitely. Um, hear her. Is she, who's her mom? I don't know. Okay. Okay. Arietta is the name I think of of um, one of our friends that sings with us, and I'm gonna kill myself for not. Just like immediately having well, a name. It would not surprise me if it was the same person. Um, just because, you know, this town, it's like... Yeah. Every st- recording session I'm in, I'm like, you, 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 what? Yeah. Are we all here at the same time? Yeah. Okay, I got it. Is she LaRonda Steele's daughter? Oh, um, no. Okay. Uh, so I, I thought LaRonda know. Steele has two daughters and... Oh, my God. Yeah, what's And I think name? one of them is called... Um, are you? I know who... I know... I know who you're talking about. Oh, really? She's, um... Yeah, I know who you're talking about. She slays, too. Yeah. Lorana um, Steele knows my... Yeah, Lorana Steele does not mo- know my name. So I get... She can get... You know. But we've sang together a lot. And she's like... And I was with the... Uh, 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 Portland Interfaith Gospel Choir. For a little tiny bit. And uh, I sang with them for a little while. And she started directing them. You know, and, and there is nothing like learning to sing real gospel. Um... Oh, what I was going to say about Arietta, though, is I was just in a um, uh, session with her one time, and um, she listened to this guitar player who could sing and play at the same time, his solos, you know? You know? And she was like, that right there. She said to her her other backup singers who were with her, that right there. She's like, that's what we need to do. You know, we need to learn an instrument because it's going to make us a better singer if you can, you know? Yeah. And I was just like, <laughs> she's like you know a choir boss for sure so to her, hear her you know look to somebody else and be like you know like you said earlier I wish I could sing from the drummer it's like we might look at the drummer and say oh I wish I could play all that stuff oh yeah I could like, never do what he's doing everyone's got their thing you know everyone's yeah. got their thing you know? yeah so. um, and then we gotta figure out a thing we gotta figure out mastery we gotta make it serve you know and once it serves we can trust and that is the place that people got to be fearless. If you start doing a drawing crafts and you get on Proco TV like I was talking about right here. Can I interrupt you real quick? Do you mean trust like in yourself as a producer? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Trust that, um, you know, you go on there and you learn some drawing and um, you get better at drawing and you know it's really a not a good piece of work and people... Um, love it and they want it is like give it to them yeah, and for sure. let yourself be educated if you start drawing also start educating yourself the need for your own change because that's all mastery is is getting one thing down but then taking that like I said about Paul bringing me the next step forward like you said I got all my one two threes as soon as you give me a four it's a new world again you know what I mean and that education, how fun that, is, that how change, yeah, it's it is. it's happened. You are now a different musician with a different set of tools. Um, the the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. The last 
of the habits is to put down the tools that you're using and pick up new ones for the for the change of it, you know. But once you do that, you got to start educating yourself. Once you start drawing, learning about art, because you're going to find artists and the way they lived throughout history, that their lives will shine on you. And it will resonate your own principles, your own purpose. I personally <laughs> am exactly like Leonardo da Vinci. <laughs> oh, I know. I'm left-handed. I got a high IQ. And I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not so convinced about either of these gender assignments, you know, being pansexual or bisexual in my life, having long-term relationships with a couple of different genders, <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, being that. And I'm, I'm very much Da Vinci-like, very left-handed in the way that I think. And I'm not thinking like that person over there and that, that being of an, the, the, the being of a different mind. Of the people around, so I don't want well, to get. It's, it's good to just know what your, or you know, you're lucky to know what your style is, and then you can ride that wave, you know, because like I feel like a lot of people are just bumping their head against the wall. Right. You know? Your excellence that you're going to bring out is always there. Your ability to tell a story comes from you copying the way people tell stories around you, and liking it, you know, and then the poetry is always there. I think a lot of Joni Mitchell's, the essence of the poetry that she puts into her lyrics and music is just her. Yeah. The poet is her. Yeah, for sure. Do you get what I'm saying? The artist is you, so trust that, is yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah. Trust that you're going to learn, you know, open yourself up to history. Emerson says in his essay on history, Ralph Waldo Emerson, the great American, um, uh, uh, enlightened metaphysical thinker you know a lot of what we think about of just this conversation being so american you know we're we're talking about trade we're talking about um uh uh the way things are changing out there and it's not just applying art it's putting art back into it where it belongs you know it's one of the parts in the engine that drives our culture and society yeah, yeah. and 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 our this is gonna sound all patriotic but our ability to do so like if you're in like communist china or something it's like you get they'll put you in prison for making certain art you know? not very many conversations about mastery and excellence and magic you know, about so like, image and story and poetry that is you're honoring yourself and you know it's like but not for the purpose of doing anything else that serves because it's and that's the just the logic of how i'm going to circulate it serves this piece is not here you know person that I love so much is just a painting that I had laying around. No, it's a picture that she took. You know, it's got something to it. Yeah. You know, and hopefully there'll be a little magic in that. And that's what I was saying about somebody like Joni Mitchell. The poet is me. If I have an idea for a story and I put it up, it's probably going to work. And Georgia O'Keeffe, do you know who that is? Uh, She's a yeah. female artist. She Not painted really. the big flowers. Okay. And she is and will be remembered as a great artist and a big deal about that. It, she's almost like Joni Mitchell before Joni Mitchell, right? She, uh, 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 Georgia O'Keeffe began working in the, in the mid twenties and worked through the sixties as a, an older artist. And, um, she worked in New Mexico and painted, um, uh, many different things. She's a, a, a a master artist, and uh, while she didn't, it, she was more uh, 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 carrying carrying over the the ideas about modern design uh, that she learned in school. That that she carried that into her art. So, um, not that her work is absolutely the most original, but it is recognized as some of the great original work. Um, what she has to say about being an artist later in life, as she's in New Mexico, there is a beautiful documentary of her. And this is what I mean about once you, once you get to your excellence and you've got your mastery and you're beginning to trust yourself, you're, you, you can't make magic happen, but you're always going to be there when it does. Okay. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, for sure. Mm. You know how to... You know, like the muse coming in the middle of the night. And that's it. Exactly. You're there for it. You know that you're there for it. 
And it pisses so, me off when I'm just laying in bed trying to go to sleep. <laughs> well, this is what Georgia says that I'll always remember, and it's two things that are in that interview. Um, first of all, the first one that she says, and she says it with a little bit of disdain, never just paint. Never just sit in front of a, a whiteboard and do nothing. You know, you see those scribbles over there. I was still doing something, you know. Don't just paint. Don't just... She's like, that's ridiculous. And then the other thing that she says that's kind of like the other side of what she just said is, don't ever worry what you paint. If you paint a mountain or a flower or a, a, a skeleton, you know... A, it doesn't matter what colors you choose. She's like, someone will come along and like that yellow. Someone will come along and enjoy that flower. For sure. And what she's saying is the image in the story might be, you know, that's where we're heavily involved. That's, that's the time and the beat and the rhythm and the melody. The poetry, we just got to trust. We yeah. just got to, and, and I got to cite one other video that I think is really important is uh, Neil Gaiman's commencement speech. And I think on YouTube, all you got to do is just make good art. And he talks for about 15 minutes and it's along these lines and it's about, it's so much about trust yourself after you've mastered, trust yourself after you're excellent, after you're standing around with somebody that really does understand what you understand. You know, I said earlier, there's never a time that I would take, have the opportunity to show a piece that I painted to my teacher. I would never pass that up. And I would never insult his time by asking him to look at it in two minutes. You know what I mean? Both of us have a... a That's huge, yeah. Yeah, we have a... We, you know, but that other thing is really important. I'm sitting here painting alone. Um, uh, my friend David, who you know, um, the first lieutenant on my ship, um... Uh, for all those years and everything, I had a commission to paint these two girls that were standing two, uh, uh, it's on my Instagram. They're standing there together. They're both kind of playing one guitar and they have these cute pink dresses on or just cute dresses. And they both have pink boots on and they're standing on a haystack and they're just got these goofy, screamy little girl smiles. And one of my clients that I've had for many, many years commissioned me to paint it. And it was hard to paint those figures with their gesture the way it was, you know, and get that guitar to be right, you know. And one of them is standing kind of with a leg out. And my friend David came over and he's like, you're going to have to move that leg. And I had nine different reasons that I would never have to move that yeah. leg. <laughs> and finally I moved that leg. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's like, uh, we work alone, but you can, and it, you know, that I know I was just talking about trust, but that's someone I trust, you know, yeah. have the people that you trust around you when you're standing, you know, and, and you know, that's the thing that the, the, uh, the camaraderie of our friends, the, the people that are around us who are in that same kind of mastery, you know, I have uh, no use for salons. They have been the creators, the, 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 cre the creating class the wrong way. You know, we're always going to have class, but when we shove it into the, and you can use the way we create image, it's our response to fashion, which is one of our kind of like impulses as humans. It's an art form, you know? Um, and I have that thing in my experience in the art world um, and in the fashion and image world, I think that, that I'll Sassoon is um, a very potent cultural influence. I When I work to cut hair, I'm doing what he innovated. And on one side of hair was some cutting and some short work, <clears throat> but he took nine years to put it together so that we could have hair that didn't need maintenance, and the maintenance of that hair went back 200 years. You know, I mean, it's like, and then all of a sudden the entire world had blow dryers 
And that's the outward part of it, but I've been the creator of that, you know, the shift of that. When I went to beauty school, we were putting rollers in hair, but I was learning Sassoon cutting. I actually cut hair in the 1970s. I've been a stylist now for 42 years. Um, right around these days, too. It's right around the middle of October or whatever that it changes the year. Anyway, uh, and then Sassoon, uh, uh, responsible innovation of what Sassoon did came along in the 80s and the 90s and condensed and, and made it possible for what we do now. And I got, to, I got to have that education, that real education in hair, really high-end work. There's only about 10% of the color that you see on Instagram, and we could look at it sometime. It's, it's uh, very bichromatic. They don't know how to work with tint. They, they can work with bleach, but they put it under heat a lot of the times, and it wrecks the hair. And So you don't have art. It's not high-end work. You know, there's something to... You're just reminding me it's a little bit of a tangent, but, you know, kind of how we met, you know, going back to our, you know, pirate weed days, you know, it's just like... You have to care enough about your art to finance it because, um, I mean, you can go into a salon or, you know, you've, you can cut hair out of the house, you know, like, or I can go DJ or something, but it's like, I feel like, uh, we, we find other ways to finance the really important stuff, you know, versus like, a, if you're just going to go cut, do boys cuts at the salon, you know, or whatever. It's like, I mean, I, I, I don't know the, I'm making a metaphor of something I don't yeah. know about. No, it's all right. I'll but you know you. what I mean? It's like, <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? It's like your, your quick route to the money is going to degrade your potential growth as an artist. You oh know yeah. What I mean, like, oh, yeah. instead of, and that's exactly the principle I got to where I can do high end work as a stylist. Um, and especially I, I was in my, I think I was 41 years old or 40. Maybe I was even 39. And I looked around the beauty industry and I had just had the best job that you could possibly have. My boss was a facilitator for the Covey Institute. I was just quoting the seven habits a little bit. We lived and worked. Well, I got there and I said, I speak seven habits. And she's like, yeah. And so we didn't fake it. And we won every award the industry was throwing in, you know, like, we want to be like you. But at the same time, there was a wave of uh, putting in stores. There were so many uh, stylists that are not working as a team in the salon. They're individuals leasing. So they would just go to a store and get what they needed. And it eliminated our, our field staff of salespeople that called on the salon and helped them with their needs. And uh, uh, we, could, we could enlist more professionalism in salon environments. And I looked around and I'm like, there's no integrity. We're not going in a way of building something. And it was my, our industry and many other industries. And this is a time when our financial sectors were growing by hundreds of percent, but other, it, you know, so there was, we, we, we were getting the message when people would bring, bring in a, a product line. They, in the 90s, it was like, now this product line is very high end. It's very expensive. And you're, it's because a lot of your clients have a lot of expendable income, you know, and it's like, okay, we're creating class in a different way here. You know, as an artist standing in the room, you know, I'm like, hi. And so it was an absolute wonderful time working with uh, uh, Melanie Thomas Kopekin, who is now um, uh, from that point in, in the 90s for the last 21 years, she has been the president of Pivot Point, which is one of the great uh, uh, educational um, uh, companies in art. She's only she, she's an incredible leader, is all I can say. She'd have to be, you know. So, um, and and it, it are we definitely have different perspectives on the salon industry. And you know, I looked around. There was nobody that I wanted to work with or work for. I just worked with Mel. So it's like. You guys are idiots, you know? And I came up here and I started doing high-end work for everybody. Yeah. yeah. And I had this student and I tried working in salons and the second one I in, she came up to me and she goes, you know, you have low self-esteem. She really meant it too. She's like, you don't charge enough for your work. Yeah. And I'm like, eh. <laughs> and, and I got to say that recently there was a... a a person on Instagram that showed some hair color work and said one thousand dollars. 
they charged a thousand dollars for things. Yeah. And I and I it's just ridiculous. You know, there's also a barber in Atlanta. And I wish I had his name because and he's he's like doing these videos right now where he's just walking around giving people haircuts. Just walks up and talks to him a minute and gives him some badass fucking haircut. They don't even know like that he's like Yeah, on the it's, street for cool. free. You know, it's like he's high end. He doesn't there's only one or two barbers that I look at on Instagram that are better than him or you know, you know, I'm looking at the real you know, I'm I'm critiquing it. You yeah, know? yeah. So but he's badass. He's got a strong arm and, and he can do what he's doing. And he just humbly walks up to people that are just like he's showing how we walk around just like and they're like, haircut? Real? Real? You know? It's just, it grabs you by the heart. But he's got a video where he's just spitting it. He's like, I charge $40 for a haircut. I work my ass off. I make 200 grand a year. Yeah. You know, it's like, what? I charge $40 for a haircut. I work my ass off. And I make 200 grand a year. And it's like, let me repeat that to every stylist. If stylists worked as a team, colorists especially, they could do three times as much color. For sure. And, and you, would, you would make that much more money and you wouldn't have to charge. And then what we've got is like you go in and you want to get a haircut, you know, or a, a, a color, and you're just thinking highlights. And what they do is, you know, you're like committed to this, this overly done thing that's like, you know, this is fashion work or high end work or whatever. And it's just, um, uh, it's a, uh, it, it's a, a loop of damage in your, it's not really high end work at all. I'm condensing what I'm saying. My criticisms are, are, are big, <laughs> you know, but doing high end work is not that. And there is about on the other side, there's about 10% of the work. There's people still out there, uh, owning companies that do some of the best work that, is there and that's what I was saying about stupid is definitely raining right now but you can't get rid of the excellence you even some of the people that are playing around doing work that you know I'm like you know you could do better than that yeah but I'm teaching right now I'm teaching one two three and that's their excuse for being vocationalized but we sell a lot of conditioner you know and that's what I'm saying it's like um, so the, and there's that in music, there's that in visual arts, you know, it's like there are factories in China that turn out tens of thousands of paintings that box people just put up on their walls, you know, when they look great. Yeah. You know, and it, it, it takes, it takes chipping and everything. But as we work, as we just don't die as artists, real artists, real authentic artists, just don't die. And, and the, the huge block of what it is to master all the different things whether it's a sport that's a martial art or a visual art or an, uh, an auditory art the the big blocks of mastery get put as and the mortar that holds them together is your own personal excellence that you were born in with you know we were evolved we were put together to have these gifts the the greeks knew it thousands of years ago the Olympics weren't just about sport. They had all the different arts in them too. They sang and, you know, there was poetry and music and all different competitions. But that, yeah. yeah, you know, do you didn't know that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, uh, the, the real Greek Olympics were as much about all the other arts as... I bet they, I bet they wanted to invoke all the gods. Do! <laughs> the Olympians. Yeah, that's exactly, that's exactly what it is. And they knew, we know, that it's not about production or, um, you know, whatever bling that keeps us thinking that, and that, you know, that there's something that we can do that's quicker than mastery or less than, or if we leave our own excellence be behind because somebody didn't remind us that our excellence is in us. Oh God, that's so important. Yeah, you know, and it's like, you don't need to be reminded. All you got to do is go out and master something and your excellence will show up. And but that is your self-esteem. Life sometimes, like the way, also the way that life works on us, it's like we need to keep reminding each other. At yeah. least I need, or we remind me. Like, yeah. It's helpful. You, you know, this is remi reminding me of something you said earlier um, that makes me think of something. You were talking about um, uh, never to just sit down and just paint. That yeah. Said that. Georgia O'Keeffe, never just paint. And 
um, it makes me think about writing lyrics. Um, and like you were just saying now about the magic, like actually, you know, um, like I never sit down and just write lyrics. Like if you ever sit down, you're like, your song will literally sound like, I'm sitting, writing a song, you know? So like I only ever write lyrics or like I never write lyrics. I only ever just get to a notebook when something pops in my head. You know what I'm saying? When something pops in my head, it's like, you know how it is. You're in the shower or whatever and like that line and you're like, I don't know what this is for, but it's for a song. It sounds great. It rhymes, whatever. And I just collect those up and then I'll organize songs later. And that's my way of like trusting myself that like I'm not putting bullshit in the song either because it was truly inspired. Um, but yeah, it's just like to really have the magic, I had to like, you have to like test yourself in a way too. Um, and not just, uh, or, you know, not sit down and just fucking move your, you know. Yeah. I mean, when you're, when you're learning, you need to do that. Um, I, it, when I, I can go, I can go a couple months without cutting hair and stand in front of a haircut and it can be magic. It will be excellent. Yeah. No, yeah. no messing around yeah. at all. And when I sit down to, to work on a piece of painting right now, it's very workmanlike. It happens. When you put together lyrics, you know what to hang on to. Yeah. And then when they start to go together... They do or they don't. Yeah, yeah. And it's that binary, slip sure. is your excellence. That I'm not going to do this, I am going to do that. Standing on a deck when you play flat ball baskets, which we all know is sometimes called disc golf. Uh, <laughs> By the layman. Flat ball baskets. You're, you got a disc in your hand and you know, you know the energy that you're going to put into it. And it's either going to work. It's either there or it's not. And being able to, that's like the same magic for like moving my fingers on the exactly. instrument. When you, you're not thinking about what to do with your arm. You're thinking about the spot, like be the ball, Dude. you know, and when you just that. fucking, and it yeah. just happens. You're like, damn, my body's like magic. And that's so it. Crazy. I thought that what just happened in reality was the thinking that I, that's how I drew it up is what we say. Um, that's how I put those lyrics together. And there was a great thing that Joni Mitchell said. And she had a great clarification in one of her famous interviews. She goes, I, I need to clarify something. She said, I didn't say this about Bob Dylan. I said that Bob Dylan said this about himself. That he just pulled him out of a box. You know, later on in his career or whatever, you know, as they spoke together as artists. She's like, you know, she probably said, why is your stuff so poor? Because <laughs> she's Canadian, you know, she uses the whole language, you know, and he's like, I just bullshit out of a box. Yeah. And she said that, that he said that's what he's saying about his work at that moment, you know, and I don't know, you know, I, and they I'm said a... that she said it about him and she was mad about that. She's like, no, I didn't say, I wouldn't, I, why would she say something like some criticism that was negative about Bob Dylan, for God's sake? I wish you were like, hey. <laughs> <laughs> Those, those people, though, are my best friends in life, you know what I mean? Like, if so, like that's why me and Brett are bros, is because, like, we can tell each other sh fucked up shit and not be upset at each other, you know? I could be like, you know, there's people who could tell you you got a boogie, you know what I'm saying? Right, <laughs> like, yeah. You're like, bro, you're, you like, you're going to move that yeah. leg, <laughs> you know? That's you know like, what I'm saying? So yeah. Be like, you know, uh, that part in the song is not good, you know? And I don't have to make him feel good about himself, I'm just, we just get to business, you know? It's like, ah, that, yeah, you know? When we live, you know, long-term relationships, and I've known that very same person. We've we've loved him for a long time, um, and I hope that it's in frame. Is that in it frame? It is. It's it's actually it's it's half in frame. That one's oh, half okay. in frame. Um, but you can see that it's a very simple composition. Yeah. I wonder, uh, uh, anyway, and I'm not going to take it down, but you know, and and Brett can feel about however he wants about that. <laughs> but um, it's obviously a really simple composition. But it is a culmination of everything that we're talking about. Yeah. And Brett to get is, to that point where it's like, clink, yeah. and then that's it. it yeah. Embodying everything that is an art, that an artist is. And at that moment, he was in a place that was new. And he had camera at the ready. But uh, both because he grew up around film and grew up around cameras, he had that mastery. And, he, and his excellence, magic can happen because of his mastery with the camera. It was already there. But when he saw the image and the story and the poetry of that, 
He just stuck his hand out the car and pulled the trigger. Yeah, he knew what to do with it, yeah. Well, and his dad was a true, like, yeah. cat. You yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so that's like, what I'm saying. Had, all the things we're talking about are in that beautiful composition that just, it, even the frame around it gets involved. And it, it gets really redundant. And I got to say, there was one time my teacher came over to look at a piece of a large painting that I had done. And my teacher actually sat on the floor and looked at this piece for a long time. And while he was teaching me something, it's not up right in here, but it's the picture that Brett has of the ruffled water that comes in. And it's a black and white photograph and it's water. And, it, and my teacher was saying, see how these make our eye move. You know, and he was talking about my landscape, about the way the composition worked. You know, uh, 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 the way, um, and that was just something that Brett knew to take a picture of. It's always, this is meeting place, and uh, it's a very important work of art. Yeah. Um, mm. Sometimes well, the yeah, image I can be really can simple. I'm going to do this. This is my thing. I get to have a pointer, and, our, and then we can end this video, because we have to have nine more episodes. But... Gradients, where something goes from dark to light, are all over this. And there's a gradient right here that goes from there and shows that person. And then way off in the distance, there's a gradient that goes from here to here that shows how far away this is and how this is closer and how this is closer. Yeah. And this disappearing place, the, the, all the places that, where's the land, where's the water, all the stuff that's disappeared just leaves our mind open and i think that's what's very poetic about that i yeah, think man. he yeah. he just popped on the the grouping of the people and saw some great balance in it or something well uh you know we use that for the back cover of the live island album really mm -hmm. meeting place yeah and we use the viewfinder for the front Perfect, doo -doo. Yeah. okay <laughs> there's one of us that is kind of not here um what do you want to do? Do you want to do you want to finish this up? Do you want to look at it? What do you want to do? Um, let's. I think we should probably wrap it up because I think it's been two hours. Um, oh, it's been or, an hour and a half. Um, but let's do like another two hours, one. Though. We've we've covered some we've covered some ground. Uh, <laughs> High five. <laughs> but let's let's do some more, man, because it's like super okay. interesting talking. I, to you. Okay, it. I want to get Paul in the future, you know, and not too far in the future, but I think. What, one of the things that we want to know about is the way things change. And this is my little thing about, you know, what would happen in the next episode. There's a place where, in a very short period of time, women, especially women and men, got rid of every fashion and the way we looked. And it became 1900. And by 1920, it was all over. We were in the modern age. And there's a place in music that... I think of Beethoven as the first real rock star. And I think, you know, almost like what you said, became, and I think that music was pregnant with jazz and all it needed was the free thinking mind. The, sure. the, the mind that came from a different culture musically. For sure. And I think that's what, I think that we were pregnant with, you know, you see you see classical music becoming more loose in the late 1800s, getting ready for that, that crack and that separation. And you see it in art. You see it in, you know, Beethoven lived at the time of the Impressionists. You know, have you ever heard that thing that like great, great people lived on the planet at the same time? You know, like Buddha was alive at the same time as Plato or, and I'm, I'm messing that up because, <laughs> you know, but, the, the time for change for humans happens, you know, and the people show up and there were these, you know, you take music and you talk about like Elvis and the Beatles, right? Only in art, it's backwards. There were five impressionists, not a whole bunch of them. There was only five of them and they did a show at a certain time and those were the impressionists. People after that were post-impressionists. So you have the Beatles and what they did and then along comes Elvis in art, different than in music, uh, Van Gogh. Then you have Vincent Van Gogh. And after Vincent Van Gogh, art's different. But art was pregnant with what he was doing. Everything that Van Gogh said, the great master says on. 
And Cezanne is uh, uh, one of the Impressionists. Yes. And, but out of all, the great master. Because he taught us that everything we draw is one of three shapes. Or a section of one of three shapes. He reduced everything that we draw down to. Which was it, like a square, a triangle, and a circle? There you go. Or a cylinder, and a sphere, yeah. and a cone. Third, Thanks, Cezanne. Yeah, third, third, or three, third. Great master. But that's how you get to be a great master. After you're, you know, the great master is Cezanne. Van Gogh is the great artist. The, the, and that's the thing. Image, story, no. So much poetry. That the essence of who Van Gogh that and that's what we're still making movies about this guy. Do you see what I mean? Because of the poetry that he was, or we honor Joni Mitchell the way we do, because of the poetry that we get. I I listen to her music, and I feel, you know. So anyway, these people show up, and I want to get with Paul, talk about certain jazz musicians. He knows a lot about jazz, and talk about the artists that kind of were responsible for the semination and the pregnancy of like, you know, um, uh, uh, Gustav Klimt who painted the kiss, you know, the golden piece. He heard Beethoven's ninth and he painted the frieze on the first modern art museum, you know, and we even can talk about the pendulumic swing when you get the conservatism of, of the, the, um, um, the socialists come along and, and Hitler and all those guys trying to shove down the Bauhaus and all the modern movements and you know but you can't get rid of jazz you can't make fashion and you can't get rid of that Bob haircut you know and I know I'm adding a haircut in with all this other stuff like it's important but it happened with it you know what I mean and the people that are responsible are people that stay artists that's another thing Georgia O'Keefe said when you commit your life to the arts that is difficult that's uphill. Yeah, that's what I meant about me having to make money. <laughs> you know, and that's the thing. Because um, I don't, I don't want to sack. I'm not gonna start doing weddings to make money. Yeah. You know, it, people do that. That's fine. But I'm just saying that's a, the opposite direction of where I need to go. Yeah, there's gonna be a place for people to get a cheap haircut by somebody that doesn't cut hair that well forever. And we're reminded by that there is a bell curve, you know, and. Mastery to a certain point is is your grandma's lasagna that's not that good, you know. But there are times grandmas can do it with lasagna, yeah. And it's not that grandma that puts that excellence. No, I don't make it with that. I make it with this, and I'll wait for that to be delivered, you know. And it's like, and it's that's what magic is. It's your grandma's lasagna. It's it's you know I don't paint. For any, I will take a commission, but I don't paint for any money. I'm not, I'm not working to get my work into a uh, um, gallery or um, anything. I just want my art to be of service, and I want it to be excellent. And there's that the first piece that I showed there, the magic piece. Um, uh, and, and then, you know, other modern pieces that maybe we'll show them later on. I don't know, you know. But uh, um, those, those pieces bring out some um, uh, more understanding and uh, uh, a greater awareness. You know, as, as you know, we are, I, I don't want to think of myself as somebody who's going to get famous because I made this podcast. Or I don't want to think of myself as I can, you know, I can drop Paul Missile's name like I can, you know, and, and, or like that I could do, I, I can go to galleries and I can look at how certain artists are painting and I could go to another city and paint like that, you know, or whatever. Um, it's not it. You want to be there for when the art happens. You want to be there for, for what it is. And then the opportunities never go away. And that's what I mean about trust yourself. No matter what I'm going to paint next, it's going to have some value. No matter how I cut hair, you know, it's okay. And as the greatest hair colorist in the world, you know, at, for, and it, if I went through the technical of that, you'd be like, you know, and, and there's no hairdresser in the world that could argue with me. It's like, no, okay, 
if you think you're the greatest, you know, it's like, I, okay, that's great, but I did more. You know, yeah, it's talk like, about it. yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. Um, and so, with, and it, obviously, my, my color clients walk around with this high end work on their head, and people go, wow, I didn't even know you colored your hair, you know? And that's a great compliment for the way I work with their hair. But those people are now my family after I have served them for 21 years. And I F their hair up religiously. I just took blood orange and put it right through one of my blondes, my sister Lisa. I'm sure you're going to see this. You're in this. And it was, she sent me a picture. She's like, this is a little tomato-y. <laughs> and, and, you know, that, that uh, they say that in, 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 you know, and just like artists. And, and it, it, it's, it, it goes with visual arts and it goes with music and it goes with doing hair. I'm going to lose that client because she's bored. The number one reason clients leave a salon, dirt, and because they're bored. Hmm. And, and so I just turned her hair orange. Sorry. Uh, she washed it. I went over there and put some tint in and it's, it's okay now. You know, I can fix whatever I screw up, which is what the girl, I worked with a legendary colorist when I was young. One of the things that you didn't do that, you know, one of those things. His name was Sam Lapp and he goes, the only difference between me and you is I can fix what I screw up. And even on this piece of art right here, I fixed what I screwed up a couple times here, you know. Um, and I, I think that that is the, uh, the title of this podcast is Fix What You Screw Up. You know, we got a world that screwed up. We do know how to fix it. And it's as artists, as take no matter what we're doing, just make it the art, make good art out of what we are. And trust the artists around you. Don't, there'll be a time when modern people stop get buying their art at a a, a, a strip mall or a, a you know or they order it a, no they're going to get it from their neighbors you know that wilson river pottery you're going to get the, your pottery from somebody that you traded your art with you know you're gonna and and we're gonna honor as we come out of this rona it, you know andrew yang said that there's times when shit happens like this that you actually jump light years ahead of where you would have been you know it's what when we get out and we can spit on each other again and we start uh, having music in our lives again and there's people in their faces, it, 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 I, I don't care what anybody thinks about kids. You see a baby right now and you're like, oh, we're going to live. <laughs> you know, it's like we're going to get together in groups and we're going to dance and it's going to be really important. And our, our, what, how empty we are and how what we've been through is really going to show up and, and we're going to see it no matter who we are, no matter what our job is. You know, those people who work, they're going to be a great blessing. Those of us that are artists, we got to trust. We got to get our mastery together and we get that mastery from the teachers around us. And we got to trust that the mortar that seals those bricks of mastery together is our excellence. Yeah. And that okay. in that atmosphere is where magic happens. And that's what happened. A band comes and plays and two people meet and they write songs together. You know, and I think I think that is um, the launch pad for everything that you're doing, what you do, and everything that I do. Um, we'll get rich another lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> we can only. Yeah, let's just keep keep our heads, keep our nose to the grindstone. Just take our extra. I think we should do canning and just take it to Brett's brother and have him make money for us in twenty years. We'll be rich. That's what you do. You can't. You know, you can't out make your money when you have money. Yeah. You know. Yeah. You can't do that. We're we're good. We can probably end with our with our hand thing there. I tried to Well, um yeah. Appreciate you. It's good. It's good. It's There's good. a whole bunch of great stuff in that. And you might want to condense it down. No, I'm sure put it all up. You are that, that's kinda the kind of the style I wanna do with this is just like, you know, it's a couple of buds getting stoned and talking, you know. It's yeah. just what it is. Because, you know, there's endless podcasts out there and people don't have to listen to it either. So it's like, yeah. it's like we can, I'm just kind of to this place now where I want to put more out and people can choose not to listen to it rather than not putting it out. Cause I'm afraid that somebody doesn't want to listen to it. It's like, just mm -hmm. put it out. It's fine. You know? And you know, I have a lot of people in my life like you that have a lot of great things to say. Um, and sometimes it takes riffing to get there. Yeah. You know? So yeah. instead of being like, 
all right, you have 15 seconds. Like, how do we save the world? You know, it's like, you're like, maybe we don't even know where the conversation is going to get to. Mm-hmm. And then once we get there, it's like, oh, like we did something, you know, we and it's huge. work something it, out. You know, it, it's, it's horrible to say everything's going to work out. It's okay to say there is an answer, you know, and it, t- there's a difference between just saying everything's going to work out. It's not. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Well, it's you naive. Know? But yeah, and that's the thing. Our lives, at certain points, even all of humanity has gotten its shit together and done what it needed to do. And in some ways, we're still following through on that. You know, what it is, that crack and that place, it's the rise of the divine feminine. It's, it's us, you know, in those years, politically, we got rid of slavery. Uh, prohibition came along because women were being beaten. Because the man was working sixty-hour work weeks, coming home drunk, and <laughs> we were unhappy life. We what caused prohibition? At the same time, you find the national income tax, which was the only way that the government could make money. Because the only way the government was making money was the taxes that it collected on alcohol, mm-hmm. and we were drunk. Mm-hmm. We were really drunk. And we were working hard, and we were the engine of the Industrial Revolution, and we were also killing people. We were killing men. And if you wanted to start a bar, even in this day and age, if you want to start a bar, they got you. (laughs) You know, it's like those beer companies were right there to give you everything you needed for a turnkey operation. You know, and this is all in that. uh, There's one of those really long PBS documentaries. Um, I When I was working corporate, I got stuck on documentaries because you couldn't watch TV on time. You were in a hotel every night, different time, you know. But you just watch documentaries and, and, you know, learn everything. And there's very little that after a while that it doesn't stick together in your head. It's like a, a timeline of how things happen, you know. Yeah. But it's the rise of the divine feminine. The, the, the male-dominated world just wasn't going to work. And... You have all these little things in the West that made it change, you know, and and brought an end to colonialism that would have yeah. killed us, you know, and, and we were already extincting, you know, so many species and everything, you know. Well, and I think it takes a really careful thought process to fix the problems with masculinity while also not losing the gains of the West. You know, because there's like, I feel like these kids now, they're like, bring it all down. You're like, eh, be careful with that. Yeah. <laughs> Rebuild it into what? You know, what? Like, ma- you like dentists? <laughs> you know what I mean? Or, you know, our lack of thinking, you know, uh, you got to have thinking to replace it. Yeah. You know, people just want to tear it down before they got it. I'm like, you got you to gotta give me a better idea first. <laughs> and that's the thing is like somewhere in there is the better idea. For sure. Somewhere in there, sure. we do know what to do. And, and the knowing what to do is to be us. There's this sociological thing, you know, a sociologist, any, any society that gets from one generation to the next is successful. That's a valid culture, you know, you know, every one of your ancestors successfully. Yeah. And that is, uh, that's, you know, obviously if a culture doesn't do that, they die out, you know? And we see that that happens. And it's, um, it, you know, it's it's repeated or it's a choice or, you know, it just goes on. But that's the thing. In the future, we're going to manage humanity by understanding what we are. If you put me in one of those factories as a Chinese worker, I'm just going to throw myself out a window. Sure. and And you can't stop me. Because I need to not be. I am too much. Well, and I, and I work today as hard as I could because I imagine I am the Chinese worker. And rather than throw myself... Like, if you were the Chinese worker, right about to throw yourself out the window, and then you woke up here with all your pains and stuff... An opportunity. And- you know what I'm saying? So that's how I, that's how I work so hard, is because I know that I'm... Kunta Kente, you know? Yeah. Like, I know that, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so to just wake up here now, I'm like, oh, well, we got to get this going. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I got all the energy in the world, you know? So, it's like... And that's, that's the thing. That, that's the, 
we we it's realize we get, have a torch and we got it to to pass on. And I don't want to get, I don't want to drop the ball this lifetime and next lifetime be back in a position of uh, slavery, whatever that means, you know, or even just like dust bowl <laughs> or whatever it is, whatever there's thing, a, you know, there's a weird um thing, it, uh, a science fiction story from. Robert Heinlein, in, and he wrote it probably in the 60s, where he's talking about a future... You, it, it, the collection of works is called Future History Stories. And one of them, uh, there's a society, and, and you see the way he writes stuff as they talk to each other, as strangers on the street. They turn to each other, and somebody says, like, excuse me, and that person turns around and says to them, service? And it, it's about three or four times that somebody turns and they're like, service? And it's like, it's this little example of like this larger thing, like we see in some movie things and like that, you know, but like this larger idea that we understand that we're here to be of service to each other. You know, and it's not duty, you know, the Mayans called it, or the, the Mayans used the Spanish word cargo. You know, it's what I carry. And that's a Mayan thing. It's what I carry through my life is what my idea. And then Don Miguel Ruiz, the whole idea, every human is an artist. You know, we all have that. Some of us have that art cargo. And whatever excellence we can bring is our, you know, demonstration. I was singing a, uh, oh gosh, no, I can't remember what. I was singing a song um, that I had just heard on the radio. And the refrain was really fucking cool. And it was kind of George Michael-y, you know. And um, uh, I was walking to the art class, and it was like there's some new students in the atelier, right? And I don't come all the time, but if there's something going on that I want to be involved in, I'll show up as a graduate student, you know, a bunch of us, there's five or six of us that are still there after six years and seven years. Those people are learning to teach now. Um, so I go walking in and there's some new people from the church, you know, and they're little old ladies and they're just kind of doing it as a hobby and Paul is not going to say no. He doesn't care. You know, he's totally being, he's a total Jedi. So I go walking in and I'm like, you know, something, ba, ba, ba. and I'm singing, and one of the other people in the art class, and she's been in there for a year or two, right? She's like a second year student. She's one of the tenors in the choir. And she hears my voice, and she looks up. You know, it's our voice. We sing together, you know? And so I turned up the volume on my voice, and as I was walking across, I was singing basically to her, but I was like singing this song, you know? And this lady looks up at me after I got done singing. I was saying hi to Patty, you know. And she's like, show off. You're like, bitch, you have no idea. I do. <laughs> but I'm in my art class, you know. I'm one of the, I'm one of the, you know, I got this shine on me shit, you know. And it's like, uh, I, I, I would have just killed her. Forget uh, any words. I just would have fucking, uh, you know, nine pound hammer, you know. Because of that, you know, and there I am, I'm there to learn a lesson, you yeah. know, and even Same that, you know, I looked at her, I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> so the only civil thing I could say was like, do you really think I'm a show off? And she's like, yes, I do. And I went, well, it's a good thing you're in this class then. You know what I meant? You're going to see how everybody here is a fool and everybody else here talks about that you know and uh, you know that we're as vulnerable as vulnerable as we can be as we go through that mastery shit you know and and you know there she is and i'm she just wanted to be as free as you were too <laughs> dude i'm busted though because i'm i'm angry you know and like i said you know through this whole thing paul has known me for three decades now he knows me you're like i'm good <laughs> he, he loves me. You know what I mean? I know he loves me. and But I wasn't thinking. Of, I know he's over there standing there. 
And he comes walking over and he's got a little bit of stern in his voice. He says, you know, Christopher, you need to learn a lesson. And I'm like, but I also, there's a little warm spot yeah. in there. It's cold that she just threw over me, you know, and I'm like, he's talking to me right now. You know, he deigned to speak to me at this moment. And he's working on something else and he stopped me. He walks over and he goes, you know, Chris, you need to learn this lesson, you know, and it's like totally ignoring bitch, you know. He's like, demonstration is the only authority, the only real authority. He's like, demonstration is the only real authority. Yeah, so you don't need to tell anybody and not to show off. Dude, right. I have those words on a belt buckle right now. You know, it's like, I live those words. And that's what, that's how he pulls everybody forward, that one step. You know, that's how he becomes that great master teacher. He's not a great master artist. He's just a master artist. You know, he's just as good as you can get. Well, and that was the best lesson to learn in the room at the time. So he came over to you. Shh. You know what I mean? Uh, he was like, there's, and that was there's, the an thing. there's an opportunity here. Yeah. Let's just go pull this diamond out. But it's, it's, it goes two ways. Somebody speaks with authority. It's like, you can't demonstrate that authority. You don't know what you're talking about. And you, we know when we hear it and we're just like, whatever, shut up. You and, know what I mean? You so know, and like, that's the thing, Melody. You know, and it, it's like, not just me. I heard a Lizzo song, and I'm like, through the rest of the afternoon. It's a demonstration. But uh, Penny Whistles and Organ Grinders all came from going to the opening night of a opera and getting the melodies in their head and then repeating them outside for the okay. people that couldn't get in. You mean like um, street performers? Yeah. 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 They would be able to hear the music. They'd go to a rehearsal. They'd go to, you know, they would get the music. And that's then they cool. would play it. And, of course, it would make the show run for a long time. And it's like, see, that's the thing, the way society actually works. When we all get to our side gig, that we get done with it being a franchise, you know, and we you get what I'm saying. We get done with all that. And it's like, fuck the cheese that's no good. Let's have good cheese. Yeah. You know, there's a disc golf player that is from Germany. And it's so funny. He's like, you don't have bread. You just don't have bread. There's no bread in the United States. You guys just, what you guys call bread is not bread, you know. And it's like, we've lost bread. We yeah. really have. And, and there's some good bread. It comes from Canada, <laughs> you know. But he was talking about the difference between here and Europe, you know. And it's little things like that. It's like. We will, and, it, and you see it a little bit at new seasons, you know, like local companies, local companies that do good, that principle that we put in the thing like, um, uh, don't, um, if your business doesn't pay the people enough, you know, then you, you shouldn't be in business. And Henry Ford did that. Nobody that worked at his factory, the person that put on the little ornament at the end, it didn't matter. That person made enough money to buy a car and live easier back then <laughs> well yeah yeah um and and but we and we can do that again just like salons they don't need to charge a billion dollars for their work they need to do more work and they need to work together yeah and they need to understand that they're gonna make you know you got to make forty dollars every 20 minutes all day long. You got to do that 18 times. Whatever that fucking guy. I'll show you some of the shit that I follow. And if somebody makes sense. And that's the thing. In the beauty industry. Exactly like we're doing. There's people that think. There's people that are lit up. There's people that are making things worse. You know. There's people that are. You know. And, and somebody that's new. That wants to do hair. There's no way of knowing. They don't have a guide. They don't have anybody that's not has a vested interest in what happens next. And it's like, you want to learn to play the guitar, the worst place to do go is a music store. For sure. You know For what sure. I mean? It's like, oh shit. But where else do you go if you don't know? But yeah, that's you're absolutely right, you know. And those of us who've had mentors are only so blessed, you know. Because like right now, right now, luckily I have one music friend who... Um, is more of a peer. We're just good buddies, but he's way better at music than I am, so I can go to him to ask him music questions. But my um, <clears throat> my mentor, who was my, my saxophone teacher all the way through school and after school, you know, I continue to take private lessons from him for years, you know. 
he passed a couple years ago and um i've been maybe this year a lot in my music life has come up where i've needed somebody to talk to and it's been really making me feel like the importance of that relationship because it's irreplaceable and i can find like i have my my one music buddy who's a peer but he's not it's not the same like fatherly thing where they're like you know like looking out for you you know he comes there's this there's a lesson for you to learn here he knows you so well and he's watched you develop as a musician so well that he knows right where you're at and what you need next you know and i was like i just miss that you know i just well and, you know, my response to that is not public, but privately. It's like you're in the right place at the right time and the right thing is happening for you to be that physician who heals himself. You know, and it's the same thing when Paul wrote me that email. Um, he meant for me to, he didn't say it, but he meant for me to get it, that I was fully empowered. And recognizing education and bodies and frameworks and stuff, he got done with the first two years, and and I went to him and I said, Paul, I'm like, that's it, isn't it? And he turned to me and he said, yeah, that's it. <laughs> you know, he had given us everything through the class uh, syllabus, you know, through the 10-week cycle, through drawing and then painting and then color and all through that composition, you know. Um, it takes two years. And what you don't got, you'll figure it out. Which, in which you could look Through at... relationships like what you just said, though. You know, I mean, like, you got to have those people around you that, that tell you. You know, you have to be working with... There's no... I mean, working in a salon, people really help you with little two-second things that make your shit look good, you know. It's like, you know... No different than a golf tip or somebody teaching somebody to write music. You know, it's like, this would sound better if you took that out and put that in. Or, or here's the thing I love. You know, you could write this a different way. <laughs> well, and it's weird, too, because I've gotten to this place where, like, um, I generally know why somebody thinks what they think about what I'm listening to, like say somebody had a critique about a song, you know, I understand why they think that this is wrong, but it's actually not. <laughs> and it's fine. But like, I like, I can't, can't trust everyone's opinion, you know, cause they just kind of like want to cram it through whatever, you know, limited perspective they have. And it's just like, you're like, yeah, like a lot of songs do do that yeah. thing, but like this song yeah. is doing something different on purpose. You know, yeah. like only somebody who really, really deeply knows. Could... Do you know Holcomb Waller? Mm-mm. Oh, God, that's so cool. I'm going to turn you on to Holcomb Waller, and one of, our, uh, one of our episodes, we can go visit him. Okay. See what he's doing. Okay. And be like, bitch, what is up? Um, he wrote a couple albums. One of them is very much underrated. He can write a song like Joni Mitchell. And, he's a local guy? Yeah. And then he wrote a Requiem, and he's not religious at all. But he just like, okay, what's a requiem? I'm going to write a requiem for the LGBTQ community. And, and in a way, he's like a twin of mine, you know, but he's smarter than me. And musically, he's like finished, you know, musically. And, uh, uh, and then he wrote some songs. He doesn't write much anymore, but when he, his songs are fucking good. And not bullshit and he's that full orbed artist that decided that he wanted to do this requiem for the lgbtq community and just learned how to be a choir director on the spot to pull it off yeah and he worked with a bunch what he wanted was it to be a a the singers that were in it for them to be raw and organic and not that he wanted it to be like a real church choir not like a polished choir for sure he's like i don't want that so he did this and this was for pica the contemporary art thing and he took summer the and he'd written the songs and he was writing the songs while he was working with these people who just wanted to learn to sing you know and they didn't even know who he was or 
they were getting involved with, you know, but it was like for anybody that knows a gay oriented thing. And if you've never sung before, then you can come and work and sing for six weeks, you know, make your own noise, you know, and he, so he had these, and then I think four weeks before the performance, uh, for two weeks in a row, he called artists and Elliot Sit, who I was talking about, came home here and he says, you know, Holcomb's doing a thing and you could, and I went and I sang for it. And it was one of the great experiences in my life. And my twin was there. And um, there's a distant relative. But um, I have a twin. And she is exactly like me. I think she's 22 years younger than me. So it's really hard to, you know. But we are so much alike that it's actually ridiculous um she has exactly my scent we took an iq test one time we have exact one point different and um we're both left-handed we both have the same skin color and eye color and hair color um we are both bisexual our brains are just fucking wired alike she is a writer and I am a painter. You know, she doesn't do much else. What she does creatively is kind of more intuitive kind of stuff. But she's a writer. And she teaches writing on the college level. And it's really interesting how I would like to talk to her about having to teach something that is more formal than music or visual art. Yeah. Or anything else. And still get the poetry into the story. Yeah. And still be like Neil Gaiman, you know, who writes all these really neat books and some of them are really good. But he's talking to the people and he's like, make good art. You got to watch that thing. It's a, it's a, it's a commencement speech. Um, he's like, I never went to college. <laughs> I just started working my ass off and doing the excellence. And, you know, it's. Everything that, you know, in this, this, the podcast, you know, everything that I wanted to say is about mastery and excellence and magic because that magic is the only thing that's going to save you kids. You know, it's yeah. like that really is the only magic there really is. And you can see technology ain't doing it. It's not. You know? Well, and I'm just hoping, like you, you had said earlier, kind of, but I'm just hoping at some point that it'll become cool to put the phones down. It'll become cool to buy art from your neighbors. It'll become cool to not, you know what I it's mean? It's there. Art schools are closed. You know, Proco TV that I was talking about, that's going to be the new thing. Yeah. Um, uh, you do that, and then you have the power. An art job is is like, can you do it? The, the only, if you can do it, then you can have the job. But if you can't do it, we can't hire you. The only thing that I that is missing from that and I experience on the music side is scene. You know, when you got a scene, you know what I mean? It's just like, there's something in that. It's just the magic is like, it's like the muse is working on a whole group of people at one time, you know? And it's just like, I just really miss that, you know? And it's like, with the internet too, you know, I learned most... I learned most of, I learned so much on the internet. People talk shit about YouTube. YouTube's great. Like, I love YouTube. Oh, I, me too. I learned so much online. Yeah. But it doesn't, there's no scene. I mean, there's I a comment love, section. But. I would, <laughs> see, that would be the really good thing about the interview um, uh, with Holcomb. And maybe get Kate in that interview too. Because I think that Holcomb is a twin of me and Kate's. Because Holcomb and I are so much alike. It's just ridiculous. Let's do a little round table. That'd be fun. Yeah. Get it, four mics it, up. It would be. And I think that that is a really good tail end of a subject is the, the idea that we gather together the way we do to be the creators of that scene. You know, it's like we need to you know, it, it's and it and it hooks exactly into when I talk about fashion, and it's like to be very without being stand uppity, you know, or or alternative at all. I put hair 
both color and cut since the 70s as part of our cultural, you know, much more than it was. But you can see with industrialization that cult, that style and fashion come to the common man. You know, and that bringing of that is the commerce that wields some of the industrial revolution. Right. The need for the, the um, civil war from, you know, that cotton was making those fabrics that were going into middle class homes that were, you know, we were building the structure of the way we do things now. And as, as soon as we get where we are now, we're going to fuck it up. And that's it. It's just like a log jam. You know, it is. It's just like a log jam. It gets all jammed and then the key log moves and everybody's like, we do not want that to happen again. You know, it's like, we're going to spit on each other again, but we're going to do it very carefully. I hope you're right. I just don't, I don't trust this next generation. I don't think they're, I don't think they've looked enough into the past to not repeat the mistakes, you know, and it's not cool to do that. It's now, I guess it's never been cool, but I've always been a historian. I love reading about the culture and everything that's happened in the 20th century and stuff, but it's just like, I'm really worried that the technology and the, you know, instant gratification on the phones is like broken something in these kids. I hope that they can, I mean, I hope to be the next, like when I was in middle school, high school, and I had those few albums that like spoke to me through all the nonsense, like I just hope I can do that, you know, for some younger kids, you know, it's just like, I just got to make something that makes them feel like they're not the only one, you know, like thinking about things, you know. The enlightenment, you know, our enlightenment, which is metaphysical, to me, metaphysical, but also physical. Physically, you know, uh, uh, the way that the enlightenment happened, that's the trust that goes against it happened at the same time that industrialization happened. We grew up it's like evolution. right as we got stupid. You know, pretty much industrialization is a dumb idea to do it so wholesale and so neurotically. We didn't care about the consequences. We had no idea that we would have to manage ourselves as a species once we got successful, but we were headed towards success <laughs> every single moment. It's better than not having everything you need. You know, it's like now it's like we got everything we need, but now it's spoiled us. But I'd rather like, okay, can we have everything we need and then like can be a little more considerate <laughs> so we don't because I don't want to have to go back to the dark ages to learn the lesson or I don't want to have to have another civil war. I don't want to have to, you know, like it's like ridiculous the phone's so do. great what a great tool do we really have to let it consume us like it's a great tool just don't let it own your brain you know but I, well I um and in, inverting that is like when that owns your brain don't you think there's something in you that is not being able to get up and go out and run the nature of yourself is not wholly you know, and this is the thing, you can be the best gamer at the best game. And you're just being led around by the programmer. Yeah, going through a story. You're not, you you know, you may think you are being creative, but you're just, yeah. you know, it's like watching a TV series. That art is going to get on you. And it's like, sir, if you get it on you, it's going to be there all day. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh my God. You know, it's like that, that, and, and you know, the idea of being an artist, but that's why artists are like we are in the archetype. That's not gone away yet. We still pay attention to artists, right. you know, really hard because we know we need to. We know we got here by doing that, you know. Um, and we pay attention more to artists, or you know, just as we do politicians and stuff, you know. So um, it's a platform for a reason. Enlightenment, the physical, the physics of enlightenment is we translated everything from as far back. We understood history the way we do here in modern times. Nobody ever understood history the way we do. They had a partial view, but they didn't have translations of all the different languages until the 1700s. And then the 1800s was the time of like, oh, wow, there are universal principles here. We are mythology makers. And we, you know, religion and politics and everything aside, we do this. And it's a very, Socrates had it. A thousand years ago. But it's like, it's like, 
h- human history was like mostly turmoil and like raping and pillaging and then there was this like little blip of like good times and so I feel like all the kids though now have been born within that blip they don't know that it's not a- this is actually the weird thing yeah you know, this is the anomaly oh yeah, yeah, yeah. so oh well, it'll never oh yeah that no, could never no, happen yeah, or whatever yeah. it's like it's mostly that's what's happened you know it's like we're lucky we're here now mm-hmm. and um, well this is the thing what if even even uh, uh, you know, there's some beauty in uh, the first president I voted for was Jimmy Carter in 1976, and I believe that was when it went from 21 to 18. You could vote when you were 18, and I think that was a big deal. Legit. Jimmy Carter put solar panels up on the White House, and Ronald Nixon. Reagan took them down. Oh, I thought it was Nixon. Yeah. No, yeah. Jimmy Carter put solar panels on the White House. Because well, it was Nixon Carter, and then yeah, right. Nixon Ford Carter. I think Nixon, Ford Carter. But yeah, then the next Republic, Republican president took him down. Yeah. Yeah. The story before, yeah. yeah. Um. um, and that was, you know, uh, uh, yeah. Jimmy Carter had one term from 76 to 80 and 80 was when Reagan was elected the first time. And, um, it, it, you know, the Iran hostage situation was what do, 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 do Ronnie Reagan's going to, and Oh, it, you know, it's all stupid. <laughs> um, but those were they, you know we were steering away from the Nixon debacle you know we were we didn't want to think of ourselves as that um, uh, corrupted and, and that we didn't want to think especially of deep into the, the presidency it like, doesn't yeah. serve yeah. you know and everything about Kennedy what serves yeah. you know and we're still we got it on the tip of our tongue but everybody's fucking 80 and rich but that's what I'm saying is these kids, they haven't tasted the old way, so I don't know that they can appreciate. Yeah, yeah, and that's, I find myself saying that. Things used to work way different than they do now. You know, they, and, and, and now here's the thing. It's not the kids. It's the fact that that human at this time has been given no other information. Right, exactly. There's no yes. other yeah. nutrition to eat, so you don't know that cheese can taste that good. You just don't know so, um, they've never seen the world not be in strife yeah. the way it is right now, you know, or, um, they've never seen an economy that works differently than this one. I never paid for my college tuition. I was, I went to beauty school and I got an associate's degree and I never paid. I think the tuition was $1,200. I paid for my supplies, but I didn't pay tuition and the thinking then was, you know, why put me into a job and then saddle me with debt? You know, with, with debt was not a thing that everybody collected through their lives. So, you know, I mean, it was the 80s where debts and credit cards made it so that, you know, we could, the exactly like what's happening today, if you can't pay your people a living wage, then your business shouldn't exist. Only our lifestyle was that way. You know, first the dad could work and the wife didn't have to work. And then the dad and the wife had to work. And then the dad and the wife had to work and go into debt. Yeah. You know, and so that's, that's all a way of making a lifestyle while we're growing the financial markets the way we did. Yeah. And... You got to put that all together. When you get a kid that has that perspective, they're not a kid anymore. The enlightenment is there. And they're like, is all that true? <laughs> you know, and that's what you get. Like, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> Party on. And then the, the reality of disc golf, there is a community where somebody can just leave all of this shit. Just leave it and commit to the mastery of aircraft. Bro, that's why I love mountain biking and, and stuff. Dude, dude, but in disc golf, there's a competitive part of it. If you want to get fucking good at it, go. Especially girls, especially women, especially the WNBA. You know, the you'll see Althea Gibson at the top of my, uh, uh, the sport of peace. She's our patron uh, uh, vibe. She's not a saint. She's a great artist, but... Patron vibe. Yeah, Althea Gibson cut a jazz record late in life after she gave disc golf lessons, or she gave, not disc golf, she gave golf lessons. And after she won a bunch of golf tournaments, before that, she won Wimbledon in tennis. 
So as a kid, she became a tennis player because, like, supposedly Jackie Robinson made sure she got a tennis racket, which is kind of like black lore legend or whatever. But she was in Brooklyn, and they got a tennis racket and tennis court. She kicked everybody's ass until she won Wimbledon. The Queen of England had to come down and shake her ass. Hand. And her, her, the partner that she beat kisses her on the cheek. Maybe they were gay lovers. We don't know. We don't know. We don't know. But she had an act. Uh, a lounge act in the in the 60s. Cool. And she cut a record. I have not listened to it, but she's got a real low voice, you know, and like, she was that person that, you know, where's the money going to come from? How are they going to push me down? How are they going to repress me? It's like, her name is Althea Gibson, okay? Or Georgia O'Keefe, you know, it's like, oh, all you got to do is be as a woman and they'll teach you how to get through these times. He's like, oh, sure. you're facing this and it's impossible? Bullshit. Yeah. You know, in this movie that's going to come out right now about Serena and yeah. uh, Venus, you know, it's like their dad and how he... It's a fucking great role for him, and I bet he'll be one of the best roles he's ever played. You yeah. know, I mean, I'm sure that's what he put into it, because yeah. it's that same vibe, you know, it's like, no, not that, but that, that mastery and that excellence, you know, and then no doubt the magic's going to happen, you know. And that, and it's true. Everything excellent about us is magic. That's the, that's the thing. We need the magic. That's what fixes everything. That's what helps you. You know, even, even your, your, everything that we get that's kind of low quality and just manufactured, just don't go buy it. Just don't, just don't. Every, every music that's, you know, there should always be an opening band and that, and you should, their friends should be there. You know, and there should be a band that opens for you. And there should be a band that is fucking good music. There's, there's just... You know, that demonstration is the only authority. You know, and it's like, not everybody has authority yet. <laughs> you know, and that's like, in a salon, if we work salons like that, got rid of beauty schools and made every salon that teaching center where you can go in and be a model if you want. That scene. You know, yeah, that, that scene. scene. You're not going to leave looking like an idiot under any circumstances. Because somebody's going to help that poor little person. But first they got to start cutting hair on their own. And you get a cheap haircut. Not because it's cheap, but because this person is learning. Yep. And it takes them two years. It takes them two years to get there. You know, just like I said to Paul, I'm like, that's it, isn't it? Yeah. You just got to put it in, though. Yeah. And people don't do that. Yeah. They'll, they'll buy a guitar and hang it on the wall and play the same thing over and over and over. It's just like, no, no, no. You got to sweat for two years. <laughs> But it's worth it. Do you want it? Do you want to be Jimmy Page? Do you want to, you know what I mean? That's like, that important thing about change. That Waldorf thing that's in there. Because that guy hit me with that and I spun for a long time. And that's, that's the thing about the podcast and everything. It's like, what lessons have you learned that really spun you? Yeah. You know, absolutely. in a way that you were different after that. Getting Kate to talk about teaching kids. Yeah. And watching writers, it's one of the things that's left in education. It's one of the arts that is so functional that it has to be taught, you know. Yeah, yeah. But she's teaching art to artists since she started teaching high school creative writing. You know, she always had that class that she taught. She's got Shakespeare and a bicep right there, you know. Um, and and it think same thing with Holcomb being a musician that, you know, the idea of of music and the idea of making money, the things that he's done to to be involved with money making stuff, you know, and and the the art that he's committed to doing and that thing. And you know what I was saying when he did that requiem the last couple of weeks, he called in real singers, and that's when we all went in there. And so in the end of it, it was like three quarters or two thirds good singers that had experience that learned the music and got in there, and we had some great voices in there and all these voices that would jangle us a little bit and pull us but all of us were choir singers and we knew how to sing with bad singers you know but that's cool because that's the sound he wanted yeah whereas sometimes like we do that too with music sometimes we're like all right i'm gonna um you know like a chorus pedal or something you know i'm gonna play this guitar once and then i'm gonna detune the guitar a little bit and play it again and then the they just kind of waver a little bit yeah it's like a cool thing. it smacks into it a little bit uh, Holcomb and his partner, Ben, who do a lot of the playing, you know, when they play together, it's the two of them putting the show on, you know, a lot. Um, they're like, 
if you make a mistake, play it twice. <laughs> yeah. And then it's the yeah. song. Yeah. <laughs> well, no. And way. that's why he'd be a great interview too. You know, I mean, he would never. He doesn't fade. He's an incandescent personality, and so is Kate. Kate's just a lot calmer. She'd be like, "What do you want me to talk?" About? <laughs> you know. But here it is. Uh, Kate was a roommate of Brett's cousin. Kate was a cohort of Brett's cousin and had Andrew, Brett's cousin Andrew, become a roommate with Nick McCarthy and Brian Maloney and Kate Maloney. And that's the Maloney gang Maloney with Char. Gang. That's the Maloney gang. And the Maloney gang is the reason I met Brett. Yeah. And he's like, how do I know you? The second or third time I cut his hair and we're getting deep in a conversation. And he, how do I know you? You should have seen it when I took... Look at the fly in the painting right in the bottom. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> <Fucking> little fly. <laughs> oh. <clears throat> anyway. Did you hear when I took him on the car ride out to Eastern Oregon in my car when I got it all fixed up and ready? Right. Yeah, we went on a test drive and he was driving my car and everything and... It was so funny because he was like, not, I'm not the person that he goes on a car. And I'm driving, you know, and I'm driving a little bit in my car. And then I had him drive it. And he's like, oh, now I get it that it really sticks to the road way better than he thought it did. Hitting some of those corners, making yeah, it Yeah, then he got, <laughs> then he got to, and that's what the whole thing was, is I wanted him. I went out to get my shot. And I had never been on that loop. So you're like, let's roll. And it was so gorgeous that I wanted him to bring a camera. And he still he took some pictures. He's never showed them to me. I can... That's that's how we're I'm never doing. interviewing him. He's not on the list. Honestly, honestly, I interviewed I interviewed this fool already once and he fucked everything up. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No. Isn't that cool? I'm just kidding. Isn't no, that cool? He uh, can't he can't he can sit over there and ask me to play. <laughs> no, no, we did we he was supposed to be episode five. You're episode five. He, uh, we did this one interview and, um, cause I was like, hey, I mean, do Brett, you know, we'll just talk about stuff, you know, like the band and stuff. But, um, the wind actually, we did it outdoors and the wind just oh. blasted the mics. So it was, it was not usable. <laughs> but we it's got okay. it set up different when we go outdoors. I got, we... I got some wind, some wind screens now. These bad boys right here. Yeah. We got a, uh. We gotta have a disc golf day with your friend that plays disc golf. Oh yeah, hit Sean up. Um, cause yeah, these bad boys. even the ruckus can furry for the wind. It helps like baffle. Yeah, yeah. I just bought these. I haven't used them yet. <laughs> what do you know about Puddle Town Studios? Um, nothing. Okay, good. I've heard of them. Okay. Hard rocking bitches. Yeah? I think. I don't know. I just had a little liaison with one of the people that seems to be associated with it a little bit. And there's a man of mystery and things did not work out. I have to be fine with it for now. Yeah. And I hate that. Yeah. So. They come and they go. Just kind of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Keep your bait in the water. Um, yeah, I'm 63 and I was whining to this gu older gentleman that comes over and he dates younger guys also. And I like younger guys, you know, although I met somebody that was a little bit older. He's at least almost 40. He's 39. So that's but still that's so much younger than me. 23 years younger than me. This guy's 23, 24 years younger than me. Right. But I like younger guys than that. Not little boys at all. And it's like, that's not it. It's when a guy is fresh to physically be with, it's like, that's, it's like young girls in bikinis, <laughs> you know, and they, they fucking do that. And it's like, that's what I'm supposed to do in life, you know? And then there's a connection between an older man and a younger man when a man's going to live a man's life of being a gay man, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's like, what you really have to learn is to allow yourself to be loved by a man and I can be that to be very loving. I love people before I even met them. 
you know, so I love you and I'm going to do what's loving instead of what's manipulative or for sure. And then they know that they can identify that as relationship markers and good relation, healthy relationships that they want to have later on or whatever, you know, well, because I've heard that's a pretty common thing, you know, with like, um, a lot more common in guy, guy relationships. Yeah. And guy, guy relationships. And it's like everybody. Yeah. Anyway. So Somebody there's me and my there. proclivities, uh, uh, but, and it, it has to serve. It has to, it doesn't matter. It has to serve. So I don't get much play, you know, but when I do, it works out still. And I was whining about after I turned 60, the lights go low cause they see that number, you know, and I look like I look, you know, and I was saying this to Barry and he's like, he's like, um, don't be 62 anymore. He goes, just change the number. <laughs> You know, and I went into my file and I changed it to 54. I'm like, what can I pass for? And I'm like, mid 50s, you know, and I'm like, make it 54 because you'll be 56. <laughs> you know, it's like, just leave it. And the lights went back up again. It's like, oh, people aren't afraid to talk to me if they're younger. You know, it's like when you hit 60, they think you're going to die. But they're looking at the same pictures with a different number in their head. And I even met. You know, guys, this guy was 29 that I met. And I was like, I can't believe so, it. this is going to work out. And so when do you work. tell him? What? So when do you tell him? Tell him what? What your age is. Or like afterwards, oh. you'd be like, oh, like, you'd be I don't like care. hanging out and be like, by the way. Yeah. I'm 63. Yeah, we'd have to get pretty fucking serious. Yeah. I feel you. you know, which is like at least two or three months or whatever. Because. And, and, you know, it's a lie and everything, but I don't care. About it. <laughs> you know what? It's facilitated. I'm happy that you own it. You yeah. Know that's, that's where it's at. Yeah, you know, <laughs> and that's the thing. As soon as I need my integrity, as soon as it's going to cause something, as soon as it's like, you know, something weird. I feel you. You know, uh, and then I would, I would get ready and do it exactly that. At the right time, <laughs> you know, and it and it would be a thing about integrity if if something had to do with their integrity, and I'm like maybe I need to hold my integrity perfectly with you so that I can ask you to hold your integrity perfectly with me. Absolutely. Yeah. So and that you know what there's a thing about managing relationships that has to do with the best of our nature, also. You know, and that yes. something about being a stylist teaches you how to be beyond polite, but to be loving, socially loving. Yeah, yeah you have that for sure. When you, um, uh, uh, great American artist. Uh, right alongside a lot of the abstract, the great abstract artists. And um, God, he has his own signature and I can never remember his name when I want to. Um, but his signature is the only, oh, Norman Rockwell. Do you know who I'm talking about now? The American, Maybe. the all American paintings. and Maybe. Um, Not really. He had this thing. Most people think of him as an illustrator and he was really a great artistic influence. He painted our lives in, in a stylistic way. And, but he had a lot of great subject matter. But he had a principle as he began his career to never disturb the viewer. And so that's why Norman Rockwell is a Disney kind of painting. You know, it's a, it shows something, you know, he painted the Four Freedoms. Freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of whatever they are in the fucking Bill of Rights, you know. Um, and he painted these paintings that go with it. Freedom of speech is a man standing up, you know, having a vote on a union. And you know, there's a he's standing up and he's speaking his mind, you know, and there's people that are around him watching him. And it's at that moment of our freedom of speech actually working for us, you know. So he painted these thematic things and he had this principle, this code of like never to disturb the viewer. And of course, in 39, the greatest painting of the, the 20th century was Guernica that, that Picasso painted in response to when the, the German Air Force 
bombed Spain for the, the, uh, um, against the rebels in Spain. You know, when they brought in German forces to help the Spanish government against the re the rebellion. And they bombed Guernica and they killed all the people. And it was the beginning of that, like, what rules? You know, we win. Which is exact. you know, it's Trump. You know, it's like, no. You know, we're not going to fight you in the hills and the dales and it's not going to be this thing. We're going to kill you. You know, and it's like, oh. And that's what, um, that's what Picasso painted. And it disturbs the viewer. Yeah. You know, and uh, there's a lot of paintings that are really great in, um, uh, in art that are so thematic. And so they, even in the 18th century, um, one of the great paintings is about uh, some slaves being thrown off a ship because something had happened where um, they won't pay insurance on them if they're in bad health, but if you lose them at sea because of a storm, then they'll they'll pay insurance on the slaves, so and so they just the they just throw them overboard so that they could and, um, cash in on. It. And there's you know it's this really uh, graphic painting, but back then painting was the only way you did it. And you you know by that time in his career, he was one of the richest men in England. You know, and he could paint whatever he wanted and put it up and people would look at it. Um, and that, you know, the art being, and that becomes one of the most important paintings of the 19th century. You know? um, where paintings really do have an, an, an effect, you know, that's, um, you know, the stuff that Picasso did be besides uh, Guernica, besides being that, that painter just his his idea and you know the idea of who he is as a man now just doesn't work like you know there is no Clark Gable character it's Tom Hanks now you know he's a gentle sort yeah you know what I'm saying yeah. and uh, there's no Clark Gable there's there's no Picasso there's no room for a bull in this yeah you know yeah we're all in the china shop together here you know yeah um but it doesn't change what it meant to be an artist you know, you can, you don't have to mess up your whole life and the life of other people. <laughs> you know, I mean, you get it. There's musicians that just like, you know, and it, and it doesn't make them any less or more of an artist either. You know, there's no, that's another thing that we'll do with Paul and with other artists as we're around. It's like debunk talent. Yeah. That, that mastery and excellence and magic is what you're going for. For sure. You have your excellence in you. That's your talent. But you haven't got shit until you master the whole shit. Well, me and Brett, we always say, be, be like Miles Davis. You know what I mean? Because it's like, there's Miles Davis, and then there's cats like Charlie Parker. And Charlie Parker obviously was a master, and Miles Davis was a master. But Charlie Parker was... You know? And Miles Davis would be like... You know? <laughs> And so, you know, um, for me and Brett growing up, not, we never wanted to be shredders, you know? So we were just like, we found, um, comfort in knowing that there were people who were masters off of their souls and attitudes, you know, rather than having to just get super strong fingers, you know? So quick, strong fingers. Yeah. <laughs> oh God. You've got to watch two sets. You gotta watch those two violin players. You will crack up. It will. It will just. It's soothing. It's probably right up my alley. They're short. They're and and they're funny as fuck, and they're always talking about. You know, this is what, and and it, it, you just got it. They're just hilarious. It and you know, and that's the thing. It can get pretty funny, and then some of them are a bit contrived. But there's one where they're watching people on, TV. And they're supposedly like a really good violinist, a pop violinist, you know. And they're like, wait a minute. <laughs> what he just did wouldn't make that sound. You know, he's not playing it very well, but we just saw what he did with a bow. And what he, what's in the music, it's not the same. They're that good. Like lip syncing? Or yeah, something he's like, like, he's not playing. 
right then. They're playing to a track. (laughs) Yeah, you know. Bow sinking. And it's just hilarious when they, when they do that. I'm gonna check that out. Mm hmm. Mm. I love it that I didn't parade my art all over. Now, because we had enough to talk about that, that's important, you know. And it's not about that much more to teach or whatever but i start i'd start talking about art so much and uh you know what's really important about the about this was that everything leading up to that and how somebody that is just there does something magic you yeah. know that's got that's fucking good yeah you know yeah. and and nailed it uh-huh. See, that's it. Nailed it. But that's like that bullseye where you're like your true aim, you know, where you're just like, you know. And the coach, if, if you know, the coach shreds athletically. Just, you know, put him on a board. He's that German short hair. His eyes do not move. And it doesn't matter even now he went back. He was doing some skating while he was in between jobs and shit. And it, like, restored his soul. Yeah, it does. You know? And does and he got banged up, and his wife bought him some skating shoes. He fucking fell. Well, of course. But you gotta. Yeah. You're not stretching it. I. But, yeah, when you're, you know, at not 14 anymore, those falls, like, you can't just brush them off. You're like, bro, you gotta work. You don't bust a wrist or something. You know what I mean? Dude. I had a magic moment with my coach. Um... Uh, this has probably been two or three years ago when he was climbing at the place. They were both climbing. Brett. Yeah. Brett had just started, but they weren't climbing at the same place. And I'm like, so you guys, and he's like, coach and Brett. Yeah. Yeah. Is that like Brett's climbing over there and coach is climbing in the place in John's landing. It's really close to his house and he doesn't, coach is not going to go all the way over. And Brett's not going to always come over to this place because that place has the tall wall, the better place, you know? Yeah. And so booty. They had to, Oh, really? <laughs> and booty. And that's why the coach wasn't involved. I think there was some booty involved. Okay, well, that. thank God, because the coach was not involved. The coach wasn't having it, right? Yeah. Um, uh, so, I went over there and... The coach, uh, we were just going to get stoned or something. And I don't, I don't know whether Zoe was out of town or she was making dinner or something, you know, but, uh, no, she couldn't have been, she must've been away, you know? And I'm like, okay, we'll smoke. And he's like, I'm at the gym, I'm doing the climbing, you know? So I said, I'm going to get a subway and then you'll be done climbing, you know? So I sat there and had my subway sandwich sitting in subway and I went over and I went into the place and I'm like, can you see if my coach is here somewhere? You know, just like whatever, right? And so I just kind of moved to the right and all of a sudden I saw him, you know, hop to something that was about six or six and a half feet, grab it, throw his leg up and he's, you know, now horizontal and he's six foot off the ground or something. I'm like, never mind, I see him. That guy right there. And, uh, And he tries to bring his other leg up and he slips and he drops six feet horizontal and just smack. It's a, it's a mat though, you know, and bounces a little bit and does not hurt himself. He knows how to fall. You know, I mean, he doesn't, he could have, he could have hurt something if he didn't relax, but he just hit the ground. He's like, oh, I'm going to hit the ground. Yeah. And he'd done it before and he'll do it again. (laughs) And, and that's what a martial artist, you know, I mean, it's like. Not, oh, you think, oh, he's not afraid to truck. Oh, he calls them problems. You know, that's what climbers call them. I was taking on this problem. I'm like, no, you're not. You're being an idiot. You're right. You know, I mean, it's just crazy. Um, Because, see, I would break something. I would, I would have broken something. He's like straighten your arm out and just. No, I. Something. Knowing how to fall, yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's important. He kind of just stayed sleeping and, you know, and it's like, ooh. But there's still something about that skateboard is a little sneaky little bastard. You know, it's all of a sudden, it's way over there and you're on on your... (laughs) That was it. Travis went off with Maya and later on, and he got back to doing it when you, but when she was a puppy, she pulled him off that and he hit his shoulder and broke it. Yeah. 
Yeah, the concrete. And he had to walk like two blocks Which with the skateboard the and the dog, the dog and a dislocated, a, 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 like a broken collarbone almost. Uh, yeah. you know? yeah. He's like, just a little bit more and we do surgery. And he's like, well, what are you going to do? Just let it go. Yeah. And he's now he's got this like bend. You can see how one collarbone area is different than the other. Just like Brett. Yeah. You know, it's like, ah, we did not do this. That's why we can do this. We're okay doing this. <laughs> Right, but I, we we got this. I don't know. Do are you gonna listen to it again, or do you just get mm-hmm. feedback from people that listen to it? And yeah, I'm gonna listen back through it and make sure that there's. I, I try and not edit them. Um, I want it to just be a, you know, just a conversation. Yeah. But um, if there's something that like somebody like picks their nose and doesn't realize it or something, I'll just you know. Um, but uh, I I think we're probably good. But yeah, I'll, I'm gonna go back through it, and make sure there's nothing weird. Or, yeah, uh, and I because mean, it's a long thing, <laughs> people can listen, you know, and it's like, I want to get feedback, but I, mm-hmm. I, you know, and, and I got to be able to, when it comes out, uh, episode five, I got to be able to get people involved with it. Yeah, man. Yeah. I'll send you, send you a link and stuff for sure. Yeah. I, um, I don't get a whole lot of feedback cause I don't have a huge listenership, but, um, you know, it'll definitely hit the, hit the grams and people will see it, you know. I'm, you know, might get 40, 50 views or something, you know, it's not like a huge thing, but, um, but yeah, it's growing, it's building and I, and I'm just trying to do this, like, I, you know, I'm always hanging out with people having great conversations, getting stoned and just like it, afterwards, like, all right, well, see you next time, you know? And I'm just like, man, if we just throw a mic up in the room, you know, it's like, nobody's paying me for this. So there's nothing, nobody dis- disappoint. And people don't have to listen to it. So Dude, again, there's no one to disappoint. You gotta, you gotta get it that somebody went and interviewed Georgia O'Keeffe and said, "Bitch, what?" And she said, "This." Yeah. And to know the badass, you know, it's just to understand the badass about her and go get it on yeah. video and then that is in this it you know that teaching that she spoke will never end it won't end as it just came through me it. and resonated yeah it just won't end that yeah. that what she says is so valuable that that might even be the thing that you know is like the 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 idea of self trust is the thing that keeps us from being neurotic, the extra thinking that we bring into our lack of self-esteem or the reason that I have to play the bass nine times better than I do now before I can ever write a song. It's like, no, your dick is in the wrong place. We're going to help you <laughs> put it in there, you know? And, it, and it's like that it, you know, we're going to find you, you know, that person isn't going to have that education or that atmosphere about what they what they think or feel or do that has to be like, oh, I have to get an education before I can be a musician or I have to get this education before I can think of myself as an artist. And it's like, no, you have to be an artist. And there is an education that goes with it, but it's your own mastery. That's when, really and you come right. out the other side shredding, but you can't write a song. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> you know, nobody wants, and even when you solo, people are impressed for like two seconds and then they're bored, you know? Once you see someone just, blah, 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 you know, you're kind of like, whoa, look at him, look at that. But then what? It's not like, yeah. you know, it's oh, wait. Yeah. Everyone's like, okay. And the living is easy. It's <laughs> like, okay, where are we going? Yeah, you know? so, yeah, that's it too. Um, uh, you, two set does that. The fastest violin players is a couple thing they've done recently. And there's a whole bunch of them that are just like, you know, and they go and they look at the media of somebody playing the violin fast and they're like, no, he's not even playing the notes. You know, he's just, he's playing every fourth note or whatever, you know, and it's just like, sliding through it. Yeah, exactly. Through, yeah. You know, and they're like, no, that has nothing to do with time. And how awful would that be for somebody to pull your video up and fucking critique it like that? So like a couple pros who pull your shit up and they're just like, yeah, this fool is whack. <laughs> but they're very, they're very selfless about the dumbass shit that they do too. You know, they, they have games with other musicians, you know. I think their latest video is 
looking on YouTube for every instrument that has the most views, you know, and how how obscure and peculiar some of the instruments are, you know, that they don't even, the, the most views doesn't even have to do with a piccolo, you know, it has to do with something else that is named a piccolo, you know, and it's like, whoa. Anyway, they are so fun. Uh, uh, I think YouTube is the resource for the information that edifies us. Yeah. You know, I want this education. I'm going to go get it. Yeah. You can definitely learn all of history. Yeah. And you can hear some great history lectures. Yeah. And once you get to a certain point in history, you can really... There's going to be some deeper information, including uh, uh, academic lectures, people that are really focused on this shit. Yeah, you know? yeah, those are the best, actually. You know, And the same things in music. There's people that are picking apart songs and talking about stuff, and yeah, okay. You know, even when I was, uh, I was playing the harmonica for a little while, and, and I could fake it pretty good right at the beginning, because you just feel the scale, you know, and it's feel the scale and it's going to be okay. Yeah. And your friends are not going to, it's almost like a painting or, or, you know, like, uh, uh, there was a, there was back in the day when there was haircut challenges or whatever, you know, I really don't have that so much anymore. I might turn somebody's hair kind of tomato <laughs> or too much purple or, you know, I did some purple this summer. But they're mine to experiment on now. That's that's our relationship. Like, we're family. We're yeah, not a fam, yeah. We're not and that's the thing, it's like first I did it, then I fixed it, and there was a little in between time of just here's what I want you to do in the meantime, you know, and then she's like, I watched it twenty or twelve times or whatever. She goes, This is what it looks like. It looks better, but it doesn't look great. I'm like, I'll be there. Yeah. And then I fixed it. Yeah. And it's all about that relationship being just as smooth as musicians working together or, you know, but at the core of it, it's a, you know, and that's a that fucking, if you want a great song, you got to be in service to it. You got to understand that your cha-cha-cha might have to turn to a different time scene to be, it's not a cha-cha-cha. For sure. You know, yeah. Yeah, and, and you don't need five verses. You only need four. You know, it's like, Take those two and put it together. Get rid of that one. And that's why, you know, you're saying, like, I don't like to do commissions or whatever. I don't do commissions either. Like, somebody... Um, I've done a couple, and they're always horrible experiences. But somebody hits me up and says, Hey, I have a podcast, and I need some intro music. Can you make me something that's, like, grandiose or whatever? Well, I'm going to go make something that's grandiose, and it's not going to be what they had in their head no matter what, because there's too much variability, you know? And um, some people like doing that work. I've met other uh, engineers who love doing that work and they love just taking care of the person and getting their vision. But I, I have too much in my own head. I'm like, I don't have time to work your shit out. <laughs> like, like, you know I mean? If you want to, if you want to consult or if somebody wants to, that's huge. It's huge because a big part about visual arts and a big part about uh, performance on in the fill in, you don't do weddings or bar mitzvahs or anything like that. You're not going to take a band and you're not going to, you know, and that is, it's the same thing the way I color hair. I'm the best hair colorist in the world. I know what high-end work is. What you see on Instagram is not high-end work. It's not. It's, and and you can say, oh, things have changed. This is the fashion. You can, no, it's yeah. bullshit. You're yeah. frying hair. Yeah. You're doing it the way the manufacturer, you're frying hair. And your work is all just dumping tint over what you just bleached, which makes it look like two colors instead of, my work, <laughs> which is a chord of dark, medium, and light, like art is. Hello. Yeah. You know, and all of that. That's high-end work. And then you go to certain European, you know, they got a place, they opened up a place in L.A. But you can't come in off the street and color hair there the way you do in that salon environment. I can't wait to go there. Her name is Alex Brownsell, and she has a, a, a company called Bleach. And I know she got some help, but she trained the people. And she has a person on her team whose work looks exactly like mine. He's got the same hands. He's got the same sensibilities. Mm -hmm. um, he, he does things the right way all the time. He doesn't fuck around. He's not in a hurry. You know, and he's 
he's in his own thing. He doesn't publish a lot. And I talk to him and I don't tell him, I think I have told him a couple times. I'm like, you're my favorite colorist, dude. I am the fucking shit. You know, I mean, here in the West Coast, they, he would, he's in England. So he doesn't really get it that I was on a team that introduced cream hair color to us. Every, all the tint was in a bottle. That's all you had was this shit that fried the hair in it tint in a bottle you know and we had it from italy in a tube and we got the real education that went with it and that was the beginning of my career and i i was invited to become an educator and i spent three years paying my dues overpaying my dues and that was a team of champions that did hair color different than it had ever been done before and we shifted the industry towards the way it is right now and there was competition but now there is no liquid color in i think there's one broken line yeah it got broken and i was on that team good job that, well that's <laughs> that's one of the big thing nobody can say that there's 10 of us and most of us are retired you know but i was on that team and i trained with we were invited to train with the best colorists that we had and one of them was sam lapp and he had he had developed his own color line and i can fix what i screw up you know and 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 so I was there learning to do what kids, they don't anywhere near teach them how to work with tint the way I know how to work with tint. So, and then in my career, I got invited to uh, be on uh, a small manufacturer where I imported a line of hair color and developed the education for it. And then I got a job at a major manufacturer that was doing a revamp and they wanted a great colorist on staff so a no bullshit real colorist high end not any of the other people and that i went to kms we did not have a hair color line but we needed to do hair color on models to get them ready for shows and so we had me we had me <laughs> i got hired because i had been on that first team of champion and that kms was the second team of champions and we broke records and won awards and I got promoted three times. I got fired twice. Um, Let's find more promotions than fire, firing. Yeah, I got, exactly. And that value of that job, the second team of champions, one of the, the person who fired me half the times at KMS, who loved me and we became family, a stylist who was a bassist, he, he was a musician and he played the bass right here boys <laughs> you know and and he was a discipline he had been in the navy and you know oh god he was a, he was a, he did and he was a cook he could oh fuck he would sell his fucking cheesecakes for 40 bucks and this was like the uh, late 90s and the early millennium and he passed when he was about 65 because the cocaine and he did so many drugs when he was young but he was my mentor there at kms and and him and we did great work together. We became family. And then he invited me down on the third team of champions that I was on, which is the gal that was the facilitator for the, the Covey Institute. And she's gone on to win. She's one of the greatest leaders in the industry. And I worked for her. We're still friends. <laughs> she made me and my mom breakfast last year. You know, it's like, um, because I really am an artist. She really is a leader. And Real artists are great leaders. Where are you going to take people that doesn't serve? Yeah. You know, how are you going to... How are you going to masturbate on the scene that's in front of you? You know, it's like... You would never even fucking do that. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. like, it's not... That's not... And that's what I mean about what serves. It's the, the, it's the, the pulse of that scene that takes us forward yeah you know and it and it and it does solve problems it is magic you know it's the lyrics that that um that Joni mitchell wrote if you're gonna pave paradise and put up a parking lot then you know you're gonna people are gonna check out yeah you know somebody said that we didn't listen <laughs> we just didn't Mm, mm. but that's the thing all the way through there I'm coloring hair as like the teaching guy at the end of, of uh, Millennium I was on an artistic team 
and help them develop their education one more time at the end of the 90s and really refine those skills that I learned over the first 20 years. And then I stopped and I came back here and I've colored hair all this time. I don't care how you color hair. You should care how I color hair. You know, and my clients, you know, when I turn from looking at Instagram and I look at my clients, it's like they have no idea how lucky they are. They have no idea. That principle is there. The scene. I'm building the scene. I'm not making my services exclusive. And this is why. This is the real shit of why we are going to sound if that this is the beginning and we're going to none of this shit that we spoke today is going to sound stupid but then you get down to what's really rock hard at the bottom of this excuse me what's that lower chakra that you're going to you know why is your dick out sir <laughs> you know it's like because the, if you if 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 people understand the motivation for being in service to each other that you are there as a performer to serve that scene. You know, to make it pulse is, that's drummer's job. And your, your, your charisma, your energy, your lyric, your mute melody, your, 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 your performance ability, which is no different than, than, and it goes back so much to the Olympian times, the Greek times, and the beginning of theater, and the beginning of organizing and gathering. We used to just gather organically and making sound with our two hands is other animals around us when we were young were loud and aggressive and mean. You know, you hear the roar of a lion, you're fucked. But if you can bang on some shit and make it fucking loud, you're badass also. And we got here. You know, and music was the first language. Yeah. You know, and, and art... The art of making fucking arrowheads, God damn it. The art of, of how to get from one place to another, for fuck's sake. The martial art of travel. Yeah. You know, that, you know the, the very beginning of what we are, you know, some of the things about history. You know, 5,000 years ago, Chinese philosophers were talking about ancient man and how simple their lives were and how they wanted to get to that. And Picasso said, when I was 20, I could draw like Raphael, like a, a perfect draftsman, you know, a, a, a you know, Renaissance era. Realism. Raphael was, Raphael was the greatest draftsman. His drawings are just like preserved really well. The few that we have and they're exquisite. They're just, you know, so Picasso said, when I was 20, I could draw like Raphael. I spent the rest of my life trying to remember how I drew when I was six. Yeah. You know, and it's like, that's how you write the lyrics to a song. And that's the thing, that's the other end of what I was saying about the poetry that Joni Mitchell is, is just the way she is. There's a little six here, and it's like... It's really creative, you know, and that's, what we, and that's you know, to dra drop back into the podcast too, is I think that's why people like long-form podcasts, um, is because they we hear so much cookie-cutter shit on television all the time you know to hear some people just actually chop it up and be honest i think people like it you know even though even if like what we're talking about is like i mean because there's all these podcasts of like people talking about bullshit really you know it's like people they want to hear a good conversation even if it's just bullshit another thing that seems to be a tactic to get a tactic to get people to listen often which i'm doing with saying okay this is the first of our nine episodes because you, and that's the thing is like, oh, you know, what, what is that? You know, well, I got that much shit, you know, and what it's about is that there's a lot of information that comes to us where people lead up. This is the problem. These are the solutions. This is us not making the choice. Yeah. And then you just leave it right there. It's like, instead of turning everything into some kind of positive affirmation and you know from the very get-go when we not get done with our phones when we hear art around us or when we see something that pulls us away from our phones and it'll probably be on our phones <laughs> that we see some wilson river pottery you know what i mean and it, it's like 
from for right now, even those of us that don't live on our phone, we go to our phones. You know, I, I had to share that Jacob Collier little bit with you, you know. And uh, um, we got, you know, what, what, what brings us back to society, things like flat ball baskets, things like getting out in community. You can leave society. You take about two or three years, get on the pro tour. You know, if you're an athlete, if you can do it, you know, um, but girls especially, because the girls, there's only one or two girls that play and there's money out there and all you got to do is throw a, a frisbee. You know, and it's an organized thing that's ready. Yeah. To It's already growing. We need to build courses, but that doesn't keep everybody from building skills. For sure. Right? You know, and it's like, um, I said, it was so funny. I always call it one of the most graceful things we do. And I try to qualify myself. You know, I love art. I love excellence. I love good food. I love good work. The work that I do you know, doing hair, doing hair color, it, that excellence is so important to me. And maybe it's, you know, probably comes from abandonment issues when I was a kid feeling so bad. You know, I want so much to be a part of something that I want to be the best part of it, but also just a Capricorn. I want to achieve, you know, I want the achievements. I don't want to just do shit half-assed, you know? So, um, disc golf I was calling it the most graceful thing we do and saying I'm a person that does some pretty graceful stuff you know I'm an artist and I sing and I do hair and you know I understand art and everything but the art of aircrafting you know this martial art is really you know and I said it in the in the ultimate I said it's the most graceful thing we do and this guy that plays disc golf said no it's not and he's a real straight guy you know and I was probably waxing a little gay in the way I was expressing myself and he was like doing that no it's not those shut me down you know and just shut my shit right down and he goes and and he looks at me he's like synchronized swimming man so funny what is it so funny I love it I love it he's like synchronized it. swimming and I was like do you're like, actually, oh I got, I'm like, okay, <laughs> schooled. Okay, I forgot about synchronized swimming, uh, you know. Sorry. It was like, my ex-wife, the redhead that I was married for, seven, she was a synchronized swimmer, and she could do some stuff that was like, no, no, boggle your for eyes. Sure, for just sure, Just like sorry. crazy, you know. So it was so funny, so but funny I was talking to the most no, graceful thing, and he was talking from, from his, you know, and that's one of the funny stories, and that's the thing about the scene, that you got to, you, you know, I want to do really good hair on regular old people and not overcharge them. Yeah. And as soon as it's like, oh, you need to overcharge them because you don't have self-esteem. No, fuck you. Yeah. I already know how to do really high-end work. Fuck you. You know, I already know how to play all jazz, everything. I don't need to go to your fucking school. Yeah. You know, yeah. and I certainly don't need to participate in your fucking salon system that doesn't serve anybody yeah. at all. Yeah. Really. Even the people that are abusive, all they're doing is building up the karma of abuse you know it's just like fuck stop you know so but who's gonna listen to me you know whose podcast am i gonna be on jesus you know so, you know it's like fuck so you know that that idea it doesn't make it wrong it just makes it not heard that much you know and it's everywhere well and you know that's why i'm doing this too is because i know a lot of great people who have lots of great things to say and there's just not a space for them to say it so yeah. It's like, and there, but there's physics to it. There's a definite system out there, the system of salons. It's worth talking about because it doesn't work. Who does that serve anymore? You know, and it's like, wow, it's going to go away. Just like art school. You know, art school is, you know, get an art education from an artist. Yeah. You know, and that Stan Prokopenko, I think he teaches live. I think a lot of people want the piece of paper. You know, where it's just like, it's almost like, they're going to art school because they didn't like anything else and they would need a degree in like art. So well, it's like, but the, it's just like, that's not, the, yeah, there'll be art really schools really. left, but there won't be bullshit art schools. Very few art schools will be left and they'll be real. Yeah. You know, yeah. and, and your, your, uh, education there, it can't be vocationalized in the way that it was. You know, because well, who knows what that artist is going to do either. So yeah. like, why put him in a box? Yeah. We'll like, make you a graphic designer in just a few months, but you won't know any art principles, you know, and then you're not going to be in a job where people have to teach you what to do. Yeah. Is that, no, that, that's not the way the system is going to be set up. Yeah. 
<coughs> and so it's that connection between our education systems and then we go into something that and they, the intention was great you don't need that big of an education you just need this vocationalized part of it so that you can go be a mechanic or so that you can go be, be a beautician but then you just know how to follow directions we had art classes in the 70s it was there it was part of what you needed to learn boom it, it's like you didn't have a choice. You could be in choir, you could take a ceramic class, or you could take an art class. Fuck you. You got to understand that as a society, art is, right? And then you go be an artist as a stylist or a mechanic or, you know, it's like take the art that you understand yourself as. And there was a little bit of that 70s vibe, you know, it's like, hey, come on smile on each other everybody get together and you know and you go be the best mechanic you can or you know like i said that in a silly way but it's like really like if you're gonna be a mechanic do it like an artist you know not I, I, that was just everything came out wrong I'm nothing against mechanics <laughs> well but <laughs> if, if you know on video right now be, you, you can know. you can see a guy that makes videos about the car that I drive, which is a work of art, which yeah. is one of the last cars that is like really great design, engineering, look, blah, blah, blah. You know, but it gets down to every bit of quality that gets put in. It's really actually high end, you know? And then he works on him. And he's an artist. He's in Indianapolis. He's a Naptown tuner. Yeah. And I had to watch him and he does all kinds of stuff and he's an artist. Yeah. He's like, here's how you do this. Yeah. Here's how you do this. And understand that you're really serving the customer this way instead of gouging them for you know or whatever well, and he's and there's, like there's a science to it too yeah that and that's the thing is he's like here's what here's the good this here's the you know yeah. he's just giving you all the real information because he fucking cares and that the mastery of what we do we stick with it because we care and we bring out the excellence because we love and when we care about something and we love it, we can trust that something good is going to happen like magic. And that synergy, it's the physics of it. It's, it's one plus one equals three or more. And it's in nature. You know, it's like synergy is real. Magic is real. It, you can't make it happen. And it does happen. You know, we see it in weather patterns where something is just like, oh, way worse than we thought it was going to be or shit. You know? Shit compounds, yeah. Mm -hmm. Exponentially. The, uh, the grove is stronger than the individual wood that's in it. You know, then the, the, the grove is stronger by the way it's shaped and formed. Yeah, yeah. That synergy, that's, you know, it's more than what it looks like. It's more than what it is. And, and in the history of music that I think is so neat because you see the actual history of music is the layering. You know, like when I say that we're preg we were pregnant with jazz, you know, and there was times that in history that you see from that guy's history of music thing where uh, uh, we only needed to make an interesting sound in a cathedral. So we just... <laughs> and then somebody went, what? <laughs> you know, that was such a beautiful... And, and when it happened... That's going to be good in that podcast. Where, cause, and then whenever... Cause, we're listening to each other and we refer back to what we're saying and that gives the thing the line of cohesion. Yeah. And both of us worked to do that, you know. So yeah. That's important because the value of what we're saying, you know. And what it is, is going all the way to beyond. How do you live your life? How do you get this old? I know all of these things. I got to be on those teams. I stopped because I already was teaching people that the only success that you'll ever be fulfilled by is the success that you designed for yourself. I knew that before I came home here and started trying to be in a salon. And then it took people around me to go just work at home for a little while. And then somebody else said, are you done? I would put color on her hair and to cover her gray. She's like, are you done? Because I'd already cut it. And we were just waiting for it to process and wash it off. And she's like, before I start my second glass of wine, I'm going to drive home and wash it off when I get there. And I went, okay. And that was the beginning of what we call drive-bys. And I'm a good enough colorist. I know what it's going to look like. I don't need to see it. I 
I am who I am, you know? And so standing there in my kitchen, I could put color on their hair and send them home to wash it out. And my work is done. I don't have to charge them for the other half of the work that I had to do for For them, you know? So it, it fit the economy. It was like, make a direct connection with your people's needs. And this chick was a, a, a great catering manager. She was an artist at being a catering manager, you know, and she was fucking tired. She had a big job managing the whole department that yeah. did a lot of catering, you know. Um, and she was tired and she was getting her hair colored by me and that was all good, but she even made it even more yeah. beneficial to her and I started spreading that out. I realized, I'm like, would you like to do this drive-by? And pretty soon I'm like, I only do drive-bys. We're not washing it out. And even to this day, people washing their hair out here is like. Yeah, because you're like, it's an extra step. We could yeah. add a little higher efficiency. But then every once in a while you get tomato. <laughs> but you have that relationship that you just, you're like, That's all right, right. you'll be cool. A couple of days, right. you know. Yeah. You know. I mean, I knew, I knew what we were going to do. You know, and and it's like both of us accepting it. Her husband is it's for schnitzel, you know, and he's like, I I went up, I do her hair at her house now, and he was there, and he's like, he, he was gonna give me shit, like I didn't know what I was doing, you know, and it's like I know what I'm doing. We're not being bored, you know, and I had answers for in principle, and he had to shut up after a little while. Yeah, yeah. you know, um, uh, uh, and and he got it that that's we're we're not going to be bored um and that's something that musicians take into the way they change doing music is like i don't need to sound like that anymore sure or musicians that try to stay the same you know try to use the same hooks all the time yeah it's like no you're dave matthews now yeah Yeah. especially if it's somebody else's hooks you'd be like yeah can't yeah. Do that. And then, you know, and then there's how important jazz has become. I would love see this is the thing with Paul. I want to mark the territory in art where the rise of the divine feminine. You know, I don't mean female artists, but I mean I know what you mean. It, the rise of the divine feminine is what makes art that's about how inhumane we are more socially important. You get exactly what I'm saying. And Paul, if he was sitting there, it'd be right there. So the rise of our conscience and the release of our dominance and and brutal brutality. Yeah. You know, the, our brutality to what just just thinking of that as what happens in hand to stop what we've done for eight hundred years and start doing something new over the next two hundred years, you know. Um, when we spread it out like that, we can see it. And there's something in our nature that calls it out. There's something in our, you know, that we live into a certain time where maybe it seems like systems and everything buckles outside of it, but it's our need to change. It's us being educated. What educated Beethoven to make him say, you know, Fuck you to all the stuff and yet embellish the things that Haydn had teach, taught him, you know, to to take his education. He was a great master musician, but then I'm going to make it like this. It's going to sound like this. And then this is what beauty, this is, this defines that, you know. And, and then his motivation when you get more of the story and you see him, you know, you think of what he's doing. And then what his music does to you is it, it's, it's always making out with you. you see, he's always trying to climb up on I feel humped. <laughs> it's interesting. I feel yeah. humped on. <laughs> Next time I listen to some Beethoven, I'm going to think of it like... Dude, his variations like, get harder and harder and they get a little more intense and then pretty soon it's going to... And it's like, really? Papa, hang on, baby. No, I feel you. I feel you know? Yeah. Um, and of course, his personality was real charged like that. Yeah. Um... And it's, and it is what it is, you know, but I think that's, I, I think some of the, the things about melody that happen right after that. And I think some of the anti-statements, you know, about it, you know, um, we start to see music and, and I think it's, um, Bartok, 
and some of those late 1800s guys that and then, and then piano guy I'll have it I'll I'll know who I'm talking about Chopin um let's see <laughs> Chopin um those guys were the beginning of jazz they they weren't going to do it but it was right there as soon as somebody black went like that you know yeah. and then put those sounds and tones yeah. then it was born and then the thing was is is John Baptiste said you know in the last couple of weeks he said you know what jazz is a superpower and I went you know, he can say that. He can be that. Yeah. You know, um, he's not a superpower. Jazz is a superpower. Mm -hmm. And he's right. That's the thing that's on the other side of this. We take our problems and so we don't go far enough to it. It's like, remember why we're doing it. Why am I mastering something? Why am I bringing my excellence to it? Why? Well, think about your grandmother's lasagna. It serves. You put it in your mouth and it's magic. You will never stop eating. <laughs> when yeah. you have that, you know, it's in and out burger for some of us that really need in and out burger. You know? Well, and like I said, there was, I remember the moment where I discovered this band, Tool. Oh, uh, fuck, yeah. And I was in like eighth grade or something, and they had already been out for a lot of years, but um, is I, I just remember having an experience with this album, and it was like the only album I listened to like all year. And I just remember being like, setting like setting off on a mission to make more of that because i knew that they wouldn't like that one album wasn't enough almost you know what i mean it's like i need to make more of this vibe in the world for other people you know um mm -hmm. not like tools already not just a huge band but you know but yeah i remember that moment being like well it's I, very interesting um uh sophia urista who you gotta hear right now um if you haven't heard her sing she's the greatest singer alive right now she hangs out with a band that's called brass against the machine and one of their great songs is a Tool song. I gotta, I gotta play it. But go ahead. It's um, Rage Against the Machine with a brass band. Yeah, yeah, and it's called Brass Against, Brass Against the Machine. I think it's just called Brass Against. Um. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. you know, just making something that was gonna help somebody get through this shit. You know? Um. And that even though we don't we don't have to know how to get through it, we just need to know we're human. You know, we just need to know we're artists. For sure. And you just need to you don't need to worry about the solution because you're gonna be it. For sure. You know, yeah. it's now do it. You know, and it's like trust. It, the, and and it you know, if people don't get that if people think they're gonna get there and still masturbate on the scene, no. You're gonna serve the scene when you get there. And you're, you're always going to, and there's a, there's a principle about relationship, but there's a principle about us, our self-esteem, our self-image is born because we don't know what it feels like to be loved by us. Having loved each other and stand for love in our life for a long time, you know, we see Brett or we see other people and what they do about love and what we do about love and what, love. We can't feel what it feels like to be loved by us, so we keep trying. Um, Cause she's so fucking good. I'm glad my dog. Is well, let's to let's say goodbye to the people, and then I can clean this up while we're listening. Oh my to god! This. Do we actually have we been recording all this? Yeah. Oh my god! You should you should tell everyone where to find you real quick. Okay, you can find me on Instagram. Hang on just a second. Can I didn't know we were on for all this time. You can find me on Instagram at the Sport of Peace. Uh, and I'll and, put all the links in the bio too. So. Yeah, and uh, that's where you can talk to me for any reason, but don't. I'll just be on another episode here. <laughs> and for the Sport of Peace, this is Christopher Jenner. And everybody remember, peace is the privilege. All right, now shut it off.